y'all may...
Yes, sir. Are you sure that the door's not locked? All right. All we got is 1592 North Corridor. All we got is 1592 North Corridor. All we got is 1592 North Corridor. Have you seen the staff yet? No, I haven't. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the sentence is requesting the very last sentence 
this world did deserve to lose in such a time, so in such a horrific manner. I believe just in such a horrific manner needs to be redacted. Do you want argument, Mr. Flash, or why do you remain to be redacted? Your Honor, that was our biggest concern. Um, I, I would ask for the, for the record, I asked for the whole sentence to come out, but, but uh, I would uh, agree that it's our biggest concern. Yes, sir. I, I believe the rest of it is appropriate, so I'm just going to take out in such a horrific manner. I believe that is commenting on the charge, not on the district court, but the next state score. And then the last paragraph, the first sentence on the morning of February 9, 2005, the decision was made to take my father's life. I believe that complies with the district impact statement requirements. That needs to be redacted. Very proceed, Mr. Miller? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The next victim impact statement is from Ryan Kester. The second sentence, my father was snatched away from my family while trying to serve and protect his community. Does that need to be redacted? Then further on in the paragraph, what the defense is requesting and highlighted as I still to this day just can't understand why. What made you feel like you could take someone from the family, from the children, like you are God? I believe that needs to be redacted. Let me catch up for you, Judge. Yes, sir. Thank you, Judge. This one's all one long paragraph. The tenth line from the bottom. Got it. So the very last. Sir? I'm sorry, the last redaction the defense is requesting that I go to grant is the very last sentence. I don't think it's fair that a good, hardworking man dedicated to making this, this community a better, safer place does not get to be here on earth, but this man gets to live out his full life. I don't believe that complies with the victim impact statement. So that should be redacted. Move on to the next one. You ready? Yes, Judge. The next one is from Paula Casella. The defense is requesting the Second paragraph, which is one sentence, Jason Lou and Ellen senselessly killed Wayne, who created a horrible work with us in our family. I believe that needs to be redacted. The next sentence, this ripple effect placed one child in a psychiatric care because she wanted to go and be with Wayne. That needs to be redacted. The next paragraph. Judge, if we could go back to that one just yes, a minute. Uh, we may be able, we, we may need to say this another way, but I think the fact that uh, a child ended up needing mental health treatment because she wanted to go and be with Wayne is in fact a proper subject of victim impact and that it shows the impact of Deputy Kester that I I was going to get to that, Mr. Nunley, because the next paragraph, I think some of this is appropriate. It comes in, but does it flow in the context of it? If it could be rephrased, I would consider that. Uh, but this ripple effect, it's referring to the previous sentence, and they're all tied in together. So if it was stated in another way, I would consider it. But that all seems to be one flow in the way it's written out. And I would suggest to the what's now what's going to be the new second, the new second paragraph that um, another child ended up in mental health treatment or psychiatric treatment because she wanted to go and be with one. That would be the concluding sentence to what is now the second paragraph. Depends what your position is. That, um, I think it's more 
closely in compliance with the Fair Credit Act. I would agree with that. If that's what that individual wants to say, I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth. But if that would be said, I'd find that would be appropriate. I know you're writing, Mr. Nunn, so you let me know when you're finished. Thank you, Judge. The folks in making these determinations, I've read the victim impact statement rules, and I've read the case law on it, and victim impact statements are supposed to focus on the victim and their uniqueness and the loss of the community. And a lot of these I've taken out have mentioned about things other than that. That's why I took those out. And in abundance of caution, I've read the Supreme Court's decision in this case previously, and I think my redactions are appropriate. Yes, I'm good to go, Judge. Okay. The next paragraph starts out, This horrible act caused another child the inability to leave our home. Horrible act needs to come out. The whole sentence needs to come out. This is where I was getting at, Mr. Nunley. There's some things in the next paragraph that are appropriate, but if you take out the portions that need to be redacted, they're not going to be in context. So this horrible act caused another child the inability to leave our home. I believe that needs to be redacted. How about if we change that to Wayne's death? Caused another child the inability to leave our home? Yes, sir. What would be the defensive position? That would, again, be more in compliance. I think we would give our judgment right away. I certainly agree with that. I understand, sir. I understand your position, and if that was what was said, that would be the defensive position. Thank you, Your Honor. And, Your Honor, for the record, while Mr. Nunley is writing that, I would also just say for the record, in any agreement we might make with portions of the victim of that, we're not by any means waiving our previous motion to declare a victim of that unconstitutional. That's a misdemeanor objective, Mr. Wise. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready to proceed? Yes, Judge. Okay. The paragraph that starts with, for myself, words will never be enough to express what this act of unspeakable violence, that needs to be taken out. Act of unspeakable violence needs to be taken out. Substitute Wayne's death again, Judge. Yes. And, Mr. Wise, you requested the following sentence. Following that, I learned how much I could drink in time for my husband to come home from work and hold my head while I vomited and then put myself to bed. I think that's appropriate. I'll give you a chance to tell me why you think it's not. How does that not talk about the impact of death out on her? It talks about the impact, Your Honor. Our concern is there could be many other factors that could contribute to what she was unfortunately going through with the drinking. I think that it goes beyond victim impact because of that, and I think the concern is that there could be many factors contributing to that. This could have been a small portion of the jurors who were told to do that. Are you asking me to challenge the validity of this statement? Not the validity. I'm not suggesting that's not what happened. I'm suggesting there could have been many factors that would have contributed to the problem that she was unfortunately going through. I understand, Mr. Wise. Your objection is noted for the record, and that will stay in. I believe that is appropriate. Next, we're going to the victim impact statement of Ashley Kester. Yes, Judge. The very first sentence, 17 years ago on February 9, 2005, Jason Lula destroyed our lives. He destroyed our family. He murdered my husband. But it gets so much more than that. Because I believe that needs to be redacted. I understand the situation these individuals are in, but I don't believe that statement is required for the victim impact statement. 
to that we don't need to be stripping. How about if we make it green 17 years ago on February 9, 2005, Jason Weaver murdered my husband, but he took so much more than that because, et cetera, et cetera. Mr. White? Yeah, I think that is a direct conflict. I agree with you. No, Mr. Nolan. Just take the first two sentences out or the first one sentence? Yes, we sure. Well, no, for the record, we don't have a problem with where it begins weighing with so much and so many. It's, it's the portion of the second sentence before that and then the whole first sentence. We can do that, Judge. I'm agreeing with the defense all the way up to the word Wayne. From 17 to the top needs to be taken out. Okay. And then the very last sentence of the first paragraph starts out, he was all these things and more. The portion that needs to be redacted is, but his life was taken away from him. Take that out. Yes, Judge. All right, we're going to go to the second page, the second paragraph. The sixth sentence where it starts, he was not there to give advice on how to avoid monsters who want to harm them. He was not there because on February 9th, Jason Wheeler chose violence and murdered him. He murdered Wayne and took him away from his family. At the defense's request, I believe that needs to be redacted. Yes. And following on to the next paragraph, the very first sentence, why he left in his wake was a loss of a sense of security and normalcy that was taken for granted. That needs to be redacted. Ready to proceed, Mr. Nolan? Yes, Judge. The next page, the end of the first paragraph, we lost him forever because Jason Wheeler murdered him. We need to take all that out. She said before, in the previous sentence, we lost Wayne forever. Can we take out we lost Wayne forever or not, Judge? The very, the sentence before, Mr. Nolan, states that we lost Wayne forever. That's fine. Then, period, we lost him forever because Jason Wheeler murdered him. That last sentence, we only need to come out. Okay. I was going to leave we lost him forever, but she already previously said that the sentence before. Okay. Next paragraph, the very last sentence that begins with the breathtaking gut-wrenching fear I have of getting a knock on the door because someone like Jason Wheeler is out there watching and waiting to harm him, harm him for just doing his job and helping the community. That needs to be redacted. The next paragraph, Jason Wheeler shows to chase Wayne down the driveway, shooting him over and over. Jason Wheeler wanted to go out and leave with glory. That needs to be redacted. The next paragraph, I believe, as well, it reads, Jason Wheeler took Wayne's life and destroyed ours. He didn't care about the pieces he was creating or the aftermath of Wayne's loss or dream. Jason Wheeler murdered my husband over the years. I tried to find some way to remove the whole array of what he did from my heart, but I can't. That needs to be redacted. I understand your position, and I understand you sympathize with the position you're in, but the human type case needs to be something different than that at this point in time. So that's going to be redacted. I believe that's all. Thank you. 
Okay. Judge, we may uh, possibly order a couple of paragraphs in the last pick of impact statement to, to make the read a little bit better. I understand. But yes. it, will, it will not contain redacted language. Thank you, sir. All right. We have the jury back there? Yes, sir. Can you read, can't read the jury out at this time? You want to explain this very briefly before you do that? Yes, sir. Um, on um, William Crotty is one of the beatbacks today. Um, I had spoken with the state about the fact that um, I did not intend to do, if, if I was handling this witness, I would not cross-examine the witness, and therefore I elect not to cross-examine the witness. I've gone over, I was not only asked to go over that with my client to make sure that he's in agreement. I've done, I've done that, he's in agreement. So I'm, instead of it continuing past 580, it should be, it should end at top of 580, and when you ask for cross-exam, I would say no, thank you. Okay. Mr. Wood, have you spoken to your attorney about this? Yes. And you're fine with him doing that? Yes. Okay. All right. Who's going to be the first witness for the state? Tim Petrie, Your Honor. All right. Any reason we can't bring the jury out at this time? No, Your Honor. Let's bring the jury out, please. My name is Tim Petrie, last name spelled P-E-T-R-E-E. -E. What do you do for a living? I'm employed by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, FDLE, as a senior crime laboratory analyst in the biology DNA section. And back in 2005, what did you do? Same thing. Okay. Yes. How long have you worked with Florida Department of Law Enforcement in the biology section? Over 31 years. Can you describe to the jury your educational background and training that allows you to do your job? I have a bachelor's of science degree in pre-med biology. Um, in addition to that, with FDLE, I completed numerous training programs over the over the years. Um, primarily, a one-year-long training program in the identification of biological stain uh, called serology. Um, I completed a serology school with the FBI Academy, and then I completed uh, the primary DNA training for me was a two-year-long training program. That allowed me to uh, learn how to do the specific DNA test that we uh, do at the laboratory. And then each year we undergo either further training in those uh, topics or learning about new topics coming uh, in the future, things like that. What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Basically look at items of evidence for the presence of bi biological samples, uh, blood, semen, saliva, hair, things like that and then um, perform DNA testing on those items and then compare them to DNA samples from individuals that uh, may be involved in the case. 
Can you even estimate after 31 years how many DNA analysis you performed? Somewhere over 15,000 samples. Um, there can be one sample a case or many samples per case, but and, uh, typically we just keep track of the number of samples, and I would have to say it's probably close to 20,000 now. You touched on this a few minutes ago, but do you and other analysts at FBLE go through proficiency training on a regular basis? We do. We have to complete a proficiency test twice a year, and what that is is a, a basically a fake case where the samples are given to us by a, a company outside of FBLE. We perform the same testing that we use on casework, send them the results, and then they basically score the test and let us know if we got it right or not. And um, like I said, we do that twice a year. Have you passed those tests regularly? Yes. Okay. Have you been permitted to give opinion testimony in the area of DNA and population statistics and those types of fields uh, in the past? Yes. Can you estimate about how many times in 31 years? I've testified probably over 250 times now, most of those in involving DNA analysis and, and uh, population statistics and things like that. Can you briefly give the jury a, an understanding of what DNA is and how you use it? The DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a molecule in the cells of the body that basically serves as the uh, genetic blueprint or instruction manual for the development and function of the body. What we do in the crime laboratory is analyze very specific areas of that DNA molecule, and based on the types that we see there, and the types are based on the, the physical length of the DNA at that area, I'm able to compile a chart of information for a sample and then compare uh, that same information to uh, DNA testing from known samples from individuals and see if there's matches or non-matches and things like that. Um, simply put, that's, that's really what we're doing is obtaining a DNA profile from a sample and comparing it to the DNA profiles from the people. I'm assuming that since 2005, DNA testing has advanced. It has. Okay. Can you briefly describe to the jury the method of DNA testing that was used in this case back in 2005 when you did it? We use a type of DNA test called short tandem repeat, the letters STR for short. Um, essentially what we're doing is looking at, at, at that time 13 different areas of the DNA molecule for those types that I spoke of and comparing that information from sample to sample. And what, are there various steps in the process of how you actually do a test? Yes. What are those? First thing we have to do is get the DNA out of the cells, um, that's called extraction. Next step is called quantitation, where I have to determine if I have any DNA and if so, how much. That leads into the next step, which is called amplification, meaning um, amplifying or copying those specific areas that we want to test for. And we copy them uh, to try to give us more of a sample to get a, a result from. And then the final step is just the, uh, the analysis of the, of the results and deriving that DNA profile, that chart of information for each sample. Does anything in that testing process change or alter the original DNA? No, it does not. Okay. Nowadays, are you able to obtain DNA from much smaller samples than you were 17 years ago? Yes, and um, specifically going back 30 years, uh, it's drastically changed. Uh, we don't require much visibly of a sample nowadays to get a DNA profile, and the sample can also um, be of lesser quality than it was in the past, meaning sunlight, humidity, things like that that chew up or, or degrade the DNA would keep us from getting results. Those are not as a, a problem as they used to be, say, 20, 30 years ago. Are there things you use during your testing process that will alert you if something is going wrong with the testing process or the instruments you're using? Yes, we utilize controls while we're doing our testing procedure, a positive control, Basically, as a sample that we, we know what the DNA result is supposed to be. So at the end of my testing, I make sure that I got that correct result. And then we use negative controls, which are samples with no DNA. And at the end of the test, we need to ensure that there is no DNA present, meaning no contamination or introduction of my DNA onto the sample, things like that. Um, so that result has to be negative or a claim showing no DNA result. So those two controls that we run with every test that we do allow us to um, know that the test worked correctly. And what other precautions do you take during your testing process to prevent contamination or your DNA being introduced into a sample? Well, of course, obviously, we're wearing lab coats, face shields, masks, gloves, um, changing gloves all the time. We only look at one sample at a time. Um, everything we do is in, in closed tubes. I do a lot of work in, the, in a hood, keeping myself separated from the sample. Uh, 
and like I said, we use disposable gloves and scalpels and things like that to ensure that we're not introducing um, extra DNA to that sample. Does Florida Department of Law Enforcement's lab hold any uh, certifications or accreditations both now and back in 2005? Yes, we're nationally accredited. Okay. Is a standard procedure in DNA analysis to also do statistical calculations regarding the DNA profiles that you get from various samples? Yes, if we, uh, at the end of my testing, if I have a DNA match or an inclusion, meaning somebody's included in a mixture, we then get a statistic that relates how uh, frequently you'd expect to see that DNA profile in the general population. Is that considered, is that the term of uh, the product rule? Well, as part of that statistical calculation, the product rule is employed. It's just a, a uh, principle of statistics where you're multiplying, that's the word product, multiplying different frequencies together to get the overall frequency for that sample. Is that commonly used in the scientific and mathematical community to conduct these types of statistical analysis? It is. Okay. Back in 2005, where you provided various items of evidence connect, uh, collected in relation to the murder of Lake County Deputy Wayne Kester and the shooting of Deputies Thomas McCain and William Crotty. Yes, I was. And did you test those various items that were sent to you that were collected from the crime scene for the presence of blood? I did. Um, I believe all of them. There's many, many items that I did test. Um, I think I tested them all for blood, except for uh, the known DNA samples from the uh, individuals. Okay. If those items tested positive for the presence of blood, did you do further analysis to um, extract and examine the DNA in the blood? Yes. Did you use that same procedure you just described, those four different steps? Yes, I did. And back then, how did you test something to determine if it contained blood? It's a co uh, color change test, a chemical screening test. Um, basically, we take a sample of that, uh, or a, a rubbing of that sample on, on white paper, apply a couple chemicals, and see if its color changes to a uh, basically a very robust pink color. If it does, that indicates that that sample is um, chemically indicative of blood. And that, is that process still used today? Yes. May I approach, Your Honor? Yeah. Showing us been introduced into evidence of State's Exhibit 84 in the original guilt phase of this file. Can we analyze that item for the presence of blood? I did. And what item, what is that item? Uh, may refer to my report. Sure. That item. was a sample of uh, dirt from a roadway. Okay. When you tested that for the presence of blood, what were your results? It was positive for the possible presence of um, blood. Did you then test it, further test it for the presence of DNA? Yes, I did. And what were your results? A DNA profile was not obtained from the testing of that sample. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the testing was done, but no results were obtained. And what would cause no results to be obtained when you know it has blood in it? Um, could be a very small amount of blood present there, so in other words, not enough of a sample for me to get a result. And then with this sample specifically being from a dirt roadway, dirt and things like that also um, degrade the DNA and keep us from getting a, a DNA result from uh, an item. So soil, dirt, things like that degrade DNA so that um, there's not a good sample there for me to test. May I approach again, Your Honor? Yes, sir. Show you Mr. Mark the State's Exhibit 85 introduced in the built face of the original trial, some palmetto fronds that were collected from the scene with blood on them. Did you analyze those items for the presence of blood? I did. What were your results? Those results were positive for the presence of blood. Okay. And did you further analyze it to see if you could get any DNA 
profiles from that blood. Yes, I did. What were your results? The results uh, of the DNA testing from that sample were that the profile from that sample matched the DNA profile of Wayne Kester. Okay. And what is a profile again? Profile is that compilation or, or total of all the DNA types that we test for, that chart of information uh, representing that sample. Like I said, we test the 13 areas of the DNA molecule, so I would have hopefully information at all 13 areas, and that would be the DNA profile for that sample. And when you compared that profile to the profile you obtained from DNA from Wayne Kester that matched? It did, yes. Okay. May I approach again, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Showing you what's been introduced in evidence to States Exhibit 1 in the original, the 71 in the original guilt phase of this trial, Your Honor. Some swabs that were taken of blood from Deputy Wayne Kester's patrol car. As you analyze those items for the presence of blood. Yes, I did. And what were your results? Six different samples in here. If you need to open it, we can make those arrangements. No, I don't need to open okay. it. Let me see. Again, they were positive for the chemical indications of the presence of blood. And did you do further DNA analysis to compare them to known samples of blood from Wayne Kester? Yes, I did. And what were your results? Again, the samples, um, the DNA profile obtained from these samples matched the DNA profile of Wayne Kester. May I approach again, Your Honor? Yes. I'm showing you what was introduced in evidence in the original bill case in the trial of States 23. So the known blood sample taken from Wayne Kester's autopsy. Is that the sample that you used to compare to the items that we just talked about? Yes, it is. Okay. When you say those items, the blood from the palmetto bush or the leaves and the blood from the swab from the patrol car matched Wayne Kester's blood. Did you do a statistical analysis to determine the weight of that match? Yes, every time we have a statistical um, or a match, we can provide a statistic for that match, yes. And what were your results when you did that statistical analysis? Well, it depends on each sample because if it's a complete DNA profile, versus a partial profile or less than complete, the numbers would be different. Okay. Regardless of what the numbers are, the, the blood matched Wayne Kester's blood. So the, the DNA from those samples actually matched Wayne Kester's DNA. Correct. Understood. Okay. Shifting gears a little bit. May I approach again, Your Honor? Yes, sir. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 86 introduced in the original guilt phase of this trial. Some swabs taken from the handlebars of a yellow motorcycle found in the woods. Did you analyze that item for the presence of DNA? I did, yes. What were your results? Analysis of that swab uh, indicated the presence of blood, and I obtained a partial DNA profile from the sample which indicated a DNA mixture, meaning DNA from more than one individual. Um, results were obtained at just a few of the areas that we test for, and it was um, indicative of coming from a, uh, a mixture, and then the results uh, were compared to other samples in the case. Okay, you mentioned you got a, a, a partial profile from the swabs from the handlebars of Jason Wheeler's motorcycle. Correct. What is a pro partial profile? Meaning that at that time we were testing for 13 areas, I got information at less than 13. And specifically okay. for that sample, there were results for three of those areas that we tested. May I approach again, Judge? Mm -hmm. Showing you what's been introduced in the evidence of States Exhibit 27 in the original guilt phase of this trial, known DNA samples from the defendant, Jason Wheeler. Did you examine that item for the presence of DNA? I did, yes. And what were your results? I obtained the DNA profile for Jason Wheeler um, from this sample to use to compare to the evidence items. Did you then compare the DNA, the known DNA of Jason Wheeler, the defendant in this case, to 
the partial profile that you obtained from the swab from the handlebars of the motorcycle found in the woods? Yes, it is. What were your results? The results were that Jason Wheeler cannot be excluded as a possible contributor to that mixture obtained from Q24, which were the swabs from the uh, handlebar. Thank you, sir. No other questions, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Next witness judge is going to also be a readback from the original trial of Deputy Richard Brown, who is deceased. My name is Jonathan Olson. Okay, now to begin the readback. Morning. Good morning. Can you tell these folks who you are? Richard Lyon Brown II. And Mr. Brown, where do you work? I work for Lake County Detention Center. I'm sorry? Lake County Detention Center. Okay, and how long have you worked at the detention center? Two years. And what do you do at the detention center? I'm a detention deputy. I watch the inmates. All right. Are there times when an inmate or someone might be injured and taken to the hospital where you are requested to go and sit with them to make sure that they remain in custody? Yes, sir. All right. Now I'm going to address your, atten address your attention back to February of 2005. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. And did there come a time when you were requested or ordered to guard the defendant in this case, Jason Wheeler? Yes, sir. Where was that that you did that guarding? The Orlando Regional Medical Center. All right. And when you did this type of work, was there someone else there with you? Yes, sir. You worked in pairs? Yes, sir. And how soon was it after February 9th were you requested to go and sit with Mr. Wheeler while he was in ORMC? About three or four days. And when you were ordered to do that, were you given any instructions as to what your job was? Yes, sir. I had to make sure he was okay. No one came and got him and make sure that he didn't go anywhere. Can you speak up a little bit for me? You're kind of soft-spoken. Yes, sir. I lost my voice. So after about three or four days, was he moved from one particular part of the hospital to a different part of the hospital? Yes, sir. He was in critical care. Okay. And then he was moved to his regular room, one bed and a TV, uh, his normal room, where he stayed most of the time. And that's where you spent most of the time with him? Yes. And while you were spending time with him, did there come a point in time where he had a feeding tube or a breathing tube removed from his mouth? That was done in the critical care part. Well, let's fast forward a little bit then to the room where he spent most of the time. He had already had that tube removed? Yes, sir. And at some point, did he start to make some statements to you? Yes, sir. In response to those statements, did you contact a detective at the Lake County Sheriff's Office? Yes. And what was the purpose of you contacting that detective? Based on what he was telling me, I told the detective that he was pretty much telling me everything that happened. All right. And did that detective equip you with some sort of listening device? Yes, sir, a tape recorder. Just a regular tape recorder? A regular recorder. And what kind of instructions did he give you? He told me that I couldn't ask him any questions and just pretty much let him speak. And at that time, was Mr. Wheeler speaking pretty freely to you? Yes, sir. Why don't you tell the jury what it was that he said to you? He started off, he told me about when he came out of the woods, what he saw. He saw the deputies putting up crime, crime scene tape over by the cars, I guess. And then he talked about, well, he came out and said, he, he just said, you know, I had a choice. I could either run or I could go out in a blaze of glory. And blaze of glory is the quote that he used. He said his main intention was to go after his girlfriend, Heckerman. I'm not sure what her name was. And that was his main goal, but he didn't care how he got there to do it. He talked about being shot at and stuff. Actually, the main thing he talked about was being shot in the butt before he took off on the dirt bike to get away. And then the other part he told me about was when he was in the woods. He told me about when he heard, like, the dogs trying to come at him. 
He told us about him jumping into the river. Once he got in the river, he talked about knowing like an airboat was coming. That's why he got back out of the river to try to get back to the dirt bike, which had broken down twice. That's why he said he didn't get far enough away. He said it broke down once and he had to jimmy rig it to try to get it to work. Actually, he was pretty upset about being shot in the butt. He talked about that a lot. His main thing, though, that he told me, he said that he was trying to get at his girlfriend, you know? Other than that, he didn't really say much more. I mean, we talked about it here or there. Okay, do you remember giving a statement to Special Agent David Lee, Detective Jason Cook, Detective Ken Adams right after this? Yes, sir. All right, I'm going to show you that, and I want you to take a look at that for me. Did he say anything to you about his weapon when he left the river? Page 54. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. Other than he was trying to get back to it, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, he talked about trying to get back to it. And let's see, the dogs, the air pole, and then trying to get back to his shotgun. I don't recall the rest of it. I know he was trying to get back to his shotgun. Okay, how many times did he tell you this version of this story of what happened? Bits and pieces of it over a couple of days. A couple of times all the way through, but mostly a part here and a part there. And then he'd see something on TV and mention something about how it happened. Or he, actually most of the time he just just started coming out and telling me a lot of the time. Did he mention anything to you about how he felt about the prop officers being on his property? Oh, he didn't like that. He didn't think anyone should be allowed on his property. No one. Whether they were deputies or anybody. He didn't like that at all. He didn't think anybody had the right to be on his property. Okay, thank you, deputy. I don't have any more questions. Ross? Sir, he told you basically that he came out of the woods and found these deputies putting up the tape. Is that not correct? He told me that he was at the edge of the woods and he saw the deputies putting up the tape, like the crime scene tape. He told you on one occasion that he'd been out in the woods looking for some coyote tracks or looking at some coyote tracks when he came back and this was happening. Isn't that correct? Coyote tracks? Yes, sir. I don't recall a coyote track. And he said that this was in the river. He had gotten into the river? The river? Now, during the time that you were in there, well, well first, you were over in intensive care, and then you heard, or he had a tube removed now and then. Were there things he would, have, he would say when the tube was removed that you recall, say, to the nurses? In the beginning, he had the tube in all the time. Uh -huh. When he went into his room, he didn't have the tube ever, the ventilating tube. Right, but when that, did you describe to them certain things that he would say to the nurses? Oh, to the nurses? He did say that he was sorry to the nurses. The nurse was trying to explain to him what he had done, and he kept mouthing that he was sorry. Okay. And you also overheard some of the conversation with the pastor of his. The chaplain of the hospital came to speak to him. And what did he express to the chaplain? I couldn't really hear all of it, but I know he was teary-eyed and was crying. And he was talking to the chaplain. The chaplain had stated to him, you've done a bad thing. And he said, I know. I didn't get all of what the conversation real good. Now, the television was going pretty much constantly in the room where you were in the immediate care. Isn't that what they called it? Are you talking about after intensive care in his regular room? Right, right. Yeah. The TV was going on all the time. All the time. And a lot of things were going on about this case. Isn't that correct? Actually, most of the time we didn't really watch, like, the news. We were watching regular shows, kind of funny shows. Well, you mentioned, I think, did you not, did you not tell the FDLE that this was initially part of something on TV saying, talking about the deputies or the funeral of Deputy Kester yesterday? I wasn't there, but I do believe he watched the funeral. There was something on TV. Isn't that what you generated the first time that he talked to you? The first time was the news, yes. He did watch something on the news. He saw his picture, is what he saw. Now, they kept him in this immediate care for a good while before they transferred him to the nursing home, didn't they? I'm not even sure how long. I was only there for a couple of weeks. And during that time, he was being treated rather frequently for fever. 
I think most of the time the physical therapy people moved him around a lot for movement and things. I don't recall anything about a fever. He was also given pain medication, was he not? Yes. Did he, did he describe to you why he was so angry with Miss Heckerman? Yes, something with the kids. They had a fight the night before. He did talk about that. Did he not tell you that she was busting out windows as he was repairing this place? He didn't tell me nothing about that. Breaking his truck and things like that? He didn't tell me about breaking the truck. He talked about arguing with her, though. He did talk about that. He did say he was pretty upset with her. I don't have any further questions. You right? Yes, sir. Did he also say something to you about what would happen to the officers if they went out there? Oh, about him shooting them? Uh-huh. Yeah, he talked about that. Anybody who would have went out there, he would have shot, he said. He didn't like anybody on his property. He didn't think anyone had a right to be on his property. Whether she called him out there or he called him out there, if he didn't want them there, they weren't going to be there. I don't have any more questions. Did he tell you anything about what he did with the shells that he had while he was in the river? The shells in the river. No, he didn't talk about that. Throwing shells away because he didn't want any more killing? He told me that at the end, when he picked up his shotgun, that he was going to continue shooting, but it was empty, so he didn't have a chance to shoot anybody. I don't have any further questions. No, sir. The state's next witness is a readback as well, Judge, from the original trial of Deputy William Crotty, who's unavailable. It will be read by State Attorney Bill Gladson. Please state your name and spell it. William McDonald Gladson, um, common spelling for William McDonald, G-L-A-D-S-O-N. Okay, you have to begin the readback. Deputy Crotty, would you tell these ladies and gentlemen your full name, please, sir? William Paul Crotty. And where do you work? Lake County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with the Lake County Sheriff's Office? A little over two years. And were you employed in law enforcement before that time? Yes, sir. Where were you at then? I have about 20 years experience in law enforcement. United States Military Police Corps, Apopka Police Department, Highlands County Sheriff's Office, and the Department of Juvenile Justice. Okay, and I want to direct your attention to February the 9th of last year, asking you if you were working on that particular day. Yes, sir, I was. What shift were you working that day? I was on the day shift. What times did you work when you were on day shift? Usually 5.45 to 6 p.m. in the afternoon. And what part of the county were you working in that day? I was working in Zone 3. And where is Zone 3? It's in the northeast portion of the county, close to the Volusia County line. Is that a portion of the county that you work fairly regularly? It was at the time, yes, sir. And just so we know, how were you dressed that day? I was dressed in a deputy's outfit very similar to this one, only with short sleeves and no tie. Okay, and you, you had a uniform on, you had a badge? Yes, sir. Gun? Yes, sir. What kind of vehicle were you driving? A Lake County Patrol. Uh, Lake County Sheriff's Office patrol vehicle. Do you remember what number it was? No, I do not. Sometime that morning, February 9th, did you receive a call for service that took you to the area of Georgia Street and State Road 42 in Paisley? It took me to Georgia Street and Hilda. Okay. Is that just south of State Road 42? Yes, sir. Okay. And who did you meet at Georgia Street and Hilda? I met Sarah Heckerman. Were there any other deputies there with you when you first met Ms. Heckerman? No, sir. Did any deputies show up during the time that you were talking to her? Yes, sir. You previously had the opportunity to look at, at the item in evidence that's in evidence as states number two, correct? Yes, sir. Would you, on that, 
on that item first show the jury where State Road 42 is? And Georgia Street? And where did you go on Georgia? You said Georgia and Hilda? Yes, sir, right here. Okay, and was there a residence located there? Yes, sir. I believe I see it there on the map. Okay, and was it at that residence that you met Ms. Heckerman? Yes, sir. Now, based on your discussions with her, did you make a decision to at least consider effecting an arrest upon a person that she had described to you? Yes, sir, I did. And did she describe to you where that person should be? Yes, sir. In that description to you, did she give you permission to go upon her property for the purpose of taking that other person into custody? Yes, sir, she did. Did she describe for you where that property was? Yes, sir. And where that person would be? Yes, sir. Were there any particulars about, I believe she, he was, should have been located in a travel trailer, correct? That is correct. And was there a particular about the door being open or closed on that trailer that could give you some indication of whether he was there or not? Yes, the door was to be open. I'm sorry? The door would be open. If he was there? That is correct. Okay, and what was he supposed to have been doing there if he was there? Asleep on the couch, just inside the door. Based upon that information, did you have the occasion to send two other deputies up to that residence to try and determine what the status was at the time? Yes, sir, I did. Who was it that you sent there? Deputy Kester and Deputy McCain. Did you go with them initially? No, sir. What did you do while they had gone to that residence? I continued to speak with Ms. Heckerman. Did there come a time when you had a conversation with one of either Deputy McCain or Kester that caused you to go up to the location? Yes, sir, Deputy Kester. Okay, and where did you have, did, did you go to? I went to the residence that the suspect was at. All right, and on the same exhibit, number two, could you show the ladies and gentlemen where that residence was, please, sir? Right here. Okay, when you first went up to the residence, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen where you parked? Yes, sir, I parked behind Deputy McCain and Deputy Kester's vehicles. And were either one of their vehicles up at the driveway of the residence at that point? No, sir, no, sir. What did you do when you got up to there to the residence where Deputy McCain and Kester were? We went ahead and conducted a search of the property. How did you conduct that search? What did you do? Myself and Deputy McCain and Deputy Kester went up to the travel trailer. I did a quick peek into the travel trailer to see if the suspect was asleep on the couch and he was not there. What did you do after that? We continued to conduct a search of the property. First the travel trailer, then there was a little shed behind the travel trailer. There was a what looked like a little dog impound behind that. And we also searched what looked like an abandoned double wide mobile home. And was there construction apparently going on in that mobile home? Yes, sir. And did the three of you stay together during this entire time? Pretty much, yes, sir. And what did you, what were you able to determine about whether or not this suspect was at that residence or on the property? It did not appear that he was on the premises. What did you do as a result of having conducted that search and not found the person? I went ahead and returned to meet with Ms. Heckerman and to go ahead and advise my sergeant of what I had. Okay, so you went back from the residence that you had searched back to Hilda in Georgia? Correct. That's where Ms. Heckerman was at that point? Yes, sir. I had left her there while I went down to try to apprehend the suspect. So then after having done the search, did you bring her back to the residence? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. You indicated that you had talked to your sergeant about securing other help? That is correct. Okay. What? Who had you asked for? What special assistance did you ask for? Well, we initially discussed getting a canine, but that discussion ended when we determined that we did not know the direction of travel of the suspect, which is critical to a canine unit. I did request a helicopter to come and do an area search to see if possibly the suspect had slipped off into the woods. Do you know whether or not that had been authorized? Yes, that was authorized. Did you also ask for any specialized help to conduct further investigation of that property? Yes, sir, I did. Who was that? I asked for crime scene and an investigator. So you then took Ms. Heckerman back up to where the patrol cars of Deputy McCain and Deputy Kester were? I drove back with Ms. Heckerman. I parked my patrol car in front of the other two patrol cars, and I got out and I continued to attempt it, to interview her. So at this point, is your patrol vehicle then now the closest one to the residence? Yes, sir.
I want to show you what's in evidence of states number 72. Can you show the ladies and gentlemen of the jury your patrol vehicle? This is my patrol car here. And right here at these woods, is there anything that blocks the driveway at that point? There is. At the time, there was a gate. There's two poles, and the gate was open. Where were, in general, where were Deputy Kester's and McCain's cars at that point? Deputy Kester's car was approximately here, and Deputy McCain's car was approximately here. Okay. As you continued your discussion with Sarah Heckerman, did you ask Deputy McCain and Deputy Kester to do anything for you? Yes, sir, I did. What did you ask them to do? I asked them if they would take some crime scene tape and if they would go down and tape some of the areas off that the victim said that she had been the victim of a crime in for a crime scene. And did they ask you anything about how much or any discussion about the crime scene tape or the crime scene? Yes, sir. I kind of specified to them what areas I would like taped off. Did they indicate to you whether they had crime scene tape? They said they did not. What did you do? I kind of laughed and opened the trunk of my car because I had two rolls and I said... These were big rolls? Use one of mine, yes. And that's the yellow tape that says crime scene? Yes, sir. On it? Yes, sir. And so where did you see Deputy McCain and Kester go then? They went straight down to the travel trailer and they began to string crime scene tape in that area. And what were you doing while they were doing that? Continued to speak with Ms. Heckerman. Okay, and where were you speaking to her at? At the front of my patrol car. During the time that you were talking to her, did anything occur or did you hear anything that drew your attention down the driveway towards the house? Yes, sir. What was that? Gunfire. What kind of gunfire? It sounded like three shots from a long rifle. And when you say long rifle, what do you mean by that? Possibly a hunting rifle or a shotgun, something of that nature. As distinguished from a handgun? Correct. Okay, are you familiar with firearms? From what I've been trained. Okay, and you fired both handguns and long guns, shotguns, rifles? Yes, I fired both in the military and civilian law enforcement, several firearms. And to you, the sound of those two is different? Yes, sir, they are different. One's louder than the other? Usually a rifle is louder than a handgun. When you heard the shots being fired, what did you do? I turned to Ms. Heckerman and I told her to get down and I looked down the driveway to see what was going on. Now, at this point, do you recall which side of your car you were on? Yes, sir. Which side? I was on the passenger side. The passenger side? The passengers. Yes, sir. By the front fender. So you could turn then and look down the driveway across your car? Yes, sir. I could see pretty much down the driveway. What did you see down the driveway? I saw Deputy Kester come running up the driveway. Okay. Were you able to see anything about his physical appearance at that point? Yes, sir. What did you see? <clears throat> it looked like he had birdshot to the face. And why do you say that? It looked like BB pellets had hit him all over the side of his face. Was he bleeding from the face? Yes, sir. Was he up and moving at that point? Yes, sir. What was he doing? He was running. Where? Towards the patrol cars. And did you happen to see anybody else running after him or behind him? Well, at first I saw him trip, and I thought he was going to lose his balance. He had a very frightful look on his face. He regained his composure, continued to move towards me, and then I saw the suspect come up behind him with a shotgun. And what did that person do with the shotgun? They pointed it at his back. What did you do? <clears throat> I raised my handgun. Did the person with the shotgun make any move or alter what he was doing because of your handgun? Well, at the time Deputy Kester was between me and the person with the shotgun, I had my gun out and I was going to try to attempt to take a shot at the suspect coming up behind Deputy Kester with his shotgun, but I couldn't get the shot off because Deputy Kester was between myself and the suspect. Once Deputy Kester cleared a little bit, the suspect turned his shotgun from Deputy Kester and shot me. Which side of the car were you on at that point, if you remember? I was on the passenger side of my vehicle. Okay. Where did you get shot? In the leg. Okay, do you recall which leg? Yes, sir, my left leg. Your left leg? Yes, sir. Did you fire at the person with the shotgun at that point? Yes, sir. At that point I had, Deputy Kester had cleared my line of fire and I fired one time. Where did you go after you fired that first round? Well, Deputy Kester continued to move towards the cars. The suspect moved off into the cover of the woods and I continued to take Miss Heckerman and move her to the third vehicle behind the axle of the third vehicle due to the fact that I had just been shot and realized that the car was not very good cover. So you moved from your car, which is first in line, to the last car? Which was Deputy McCain's car. Deputy McCain's car? 
Yes, sir. Got her down behind that car? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you see the person with the shotgun again after that? Yes, sir, I did. Where did you see him at? I saw him come out of the woods where the second vehicle was. Okay. That would be the vehicle that was in the middle? That was, yes, Deputy Kester's vehicle. Okay. And what did he do when he came out of the woods? He immediately moved to the front of the vehicle that I was at the back corner of. So I moved Ms. Heckerman around to the back of the vehicle, and he was standing in front of the vehicle. And what did that person do while he was standing at the front of that vehicle? Attempted to shoot me through the windshield. Did you actually see or hear the gun discharge? Yes, sir, I did. Four times. Okay. What did you do at that point? Well, the suspect continued to move around the car. Ms. Heckerman literally disappeared from my sight. I don't know where she went, because the last I saw her was when we were moving around to the back of the car. I was trying to keep her safe and out of the line of fire. I moved around to the driver's side of the vehicle, and the suspect moved to the passenger side of the vehicle. Okay, and this is the last vehicle? That is correct. That is Deputy McCain's vehicle. Yes, sir. All right. And then what happened while, you, while the suspect with the shotgun is on the passenger side? You're on the driver's side? What happens then? There were some words exchanged, at which time I dropped down to underneath the vehicle and attempted to shoot the suspect's legs out from underneath him in an attempt to stop his attack. So you were trying to shoot with your handgun? That is correct. Under the car? That is correct. Did the person keep moving? Yes, sir. How could you tell that? Because I could see under the car that my shots were not effective. I saw the suspect start to move towards the front of the vehicle, and I knew that I needed to get off the ground. Okay. Moving back toward the front of the car then? Yes, sir. So what did you do then? I got up off the ground, and I went to the back of the vehicle and continued to keep my distance between myself and the suspect. Due to having already been shot by the shotgun, I knew he had tactically, I knew that he tactically had an advantage on me. Because you couldn't move as quick? Just the gun. It's a shotgun versus a handgun. All right. Now you move back to the back of the car. He's back at the front of the car? That is correct. What happens then? He comes all the way around to the car, to the back side, to the trunk, and I move to the back passenger door where the back of the car comes down to the trunk, and I squat it down with my handgun. Okay, so he's come around now back down to the driver's side of the vehicle. That is correct. Okay, near the trunk area? Yes, sir. And you're up right by the passenger, rear passenger door? That is correct. What happens then? Well, I thought it odd because I knew that the last that I had seen, he was leaning over the trunk of the car trying to locate me with the shotgun. And all of a sudden, I didn't hear anything, and I thought, maybe I had an opportunity to pop up and shoot him in the chest. But it's like at the range when someone jams their rifle, or they misfire, or they're out of rounds, there was that lapse in firing. So I thought I had an opportunity to shoot him, so I popped up to see if I could shoot him in the chest. And what did you see when you popped up? I saw him moving away into the woods. On the driver's side of the car? That is correct. And what did you do when you saw him moving away? I moved around to the back of the vehicle and I unloaded one of the magazines in my handgun, shooting in the direction of the suspect. How many bullets will, you, will your handgun hold? Sixteen, if there was one in the chamber. Okay. How many rounds did you fire? Well, I believe I had sixteen that day in that particular handgun. So did you fire every round? I emptied a magazine. That is correct. Okay. And then you reloaded? That is correct. And how do you reload a Glock 40 caliber? You have to drop the magazine, and then you have to take the magazine out of the pouch, put it in the bottom of the handgun, and slam it home so that it seats, and then you have to let the release go forward so the bullet will seat into the chamber. So did you do that? Yes, sir. When you fired, when you say you emptied your magazine at this person, did you see any response by the, that person at all? I thought I did, yes, sir. What did you see? It looked like he had winced at one point, kind of like on his right hip, like maybe I had hit him in the butt or the leg or the lower back. And where did he go? He continued to move off into the woods. During the time that we've been talking about, where you've been describing moving around the car with this person, did you see Deputy Kester during that time? Not until after I was done firing. Okay, let me back you up just a minute to the start of all this. As you were, after you had fired your first round and moved to the rear, to the last car, the third car in line, did you see Deputy Kester at, an, at that point? No, sir, I did not. Okay. I'm sorry. The last, the last time I saw Deputy Kester, 
was when I moved to the back of my patrol car and I saw Deputy Kessler almost immediately behind me. And it kind of struck me funny. It looked like he was sliding into home. He slid by the door, opened the door of the patrol car, and he chambered around in a shotgun. Now, this was his patrol car? Yes, sir. The one in the middle? That is correct. So the last vehicle... So the last you saw him, he was by the passenger door of his vehicle? That is correct. And that's when you went to the rear of McCain's vehicle? That is correct. Okay. Now let's go back to the point where this person has turned and gone towards the woods. You fired at him. When did you see Deputy McCain? Well, I, what I did was I went back around, slowly to the passenger side of the vehicle that I was behind Deputy McCain's vehicle. Right. I looked down to the side to see if I could see Deputy Kester, at which time I saw Deputy Kester on his knees. I saw him collapse on his face. And then I saw Deputy McCain <clears throat> immediately come around to the car and get to the door where Deputy Kester was. Okay. And what did you do at that point? I said to Deputy McCain, please check Wayne and see if he's okay. Did he do that? Yes. Did he verbally, I'm talking about Deputy McCain, did he verbally respond to you about the status of Deputy Kester? Yes, sir, he did. What did he say? He said he's blue. What did you do at that point? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Take your time. Thank you. I asked him to check Deputy Kester, and he said he was blue. I think it was a nice way for him to indicate to me he was dead. Did you move again from your location? Now, you're still at the rear passenger side of Deputy McCain's vehicle? That is correct. Did you move from, did you move from there initially? No. Deputy McCain said, Bill, we need to move. And I said, no, we don't need to move. Because of the way the property was set up and the position that we were at that point, I felt like we had him boxed in and that if we tried to come out and flank us, that we would have an advantage tactically. Deputy McCain wanted to move to an abandoned building that was a solid brick building, was an abandoned house. And I did not want to move at that point because I wanted to hold our position in case he tried to flank us. During this time, did you notice Deputy McCain retrieve his shotgun? His shotgun? I really don't remember. Okay, that's fine. So there was a discussion between the two of you about where you're going to move to. Do you, were you, did you become aware that Deputy McCain got shot? Yes, sir. How did you become aware of that? Well, holding our position, I went back to the back corner of the driver's side of Deputy McCain's vehicle so I could watch down the wood line of the one side of the property and Deputy McCain at that point had his shotgun in his hands and he was pointed down the ro roadway which was the other side of the property along the wood line. Okay, so he was on the passenger side of the cars and you were on the driver's side of the cars? That is correct. And the suspect did exactly what I expected. He came back out of the woods and engaged Deputy McCain again in a firefight. Did you see that happen, or did you hear it happen? I saw it happen. I wasn't in a position that I could fire, but I saw it happen. And how do you know that Deputy McCain got hit? Actually, he said, Bill, I'm hit, and he, I could see his leg was bleeding. And I knew that he had been hit, and it worried me because I worried about him possibly being hit in the femoral artery. So what did you do at that point? At that point, we heard a motorcycle start up, and I heard the motorcycle going what I thought was a northwesterly direction. After you heard the motorcycle start up and leave, what did you do then? Deputy McCain again said, Bill, we need to move. And I said at that time, I think that would be advisable. We need to move to a better cover because the cars have not been the kind of cover that I expected them to be for the kind of firefight we've been in. Okay, so where did you move to? Well, first, Deputy McCain says to me, he says, where's the girl? And I didn't know, and then he said, she's under the car. So we got Miss Heckerman from out from underneath the third vehicle, and I told Deputy McCain that if he would start to move out with her across the field to the abandoned building, that when he got out about halfway, I would come out and cover them for the remainder of the distance. And is that what happened? That is exactly what happened. And where did you all go from there? We went to an abandoned house that had no roof. It was just a concrete slab with cinder block. And what did you do when you got inside that structure? Deputy McCain went to what was the abandoned garage portion, and I went to the back corner of the residence. And we took and put Miss Heckerman in probably the safest portion of the house, which would have been probably the entranceway from the, what would have been a garage into the possibly dining or living area.
I want to show you what's in evidence of states number 10 and ask you, if you just would, can you point out to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the structure that y'all retreated to? This is the structure. Okay. And in general, is this your vehicle here still? Yes, sir. So the other two vehicles are down in this area? That is correct. So y'all went across that open area and into this old house? Yes, sir. Now, just by the way, you said you worked in that part of the county for quite a while. Did that, had that house burned down recently? Yes, sir. So that's why it was empty with no roof or anything on it? That is correct. Okay. Now, during the time that all of these things are going on, the jury has heard the recordings of the radio conversations between you and the sheriff's office and you and other people. What was your plan? When you got to the abandoned house, what were you going to do? You use it as cover because the information we were receiving was that the suspect had three tree stands and high-powered rifles and was going to kill us and cut us down. Now, did there come a time shortly after you got into this house that the other deputies began to arrive? Yes, sir. And who was that? Deputy DeSantis and Sergeant Lee Cheshire. And when they arrived, did you see them drive up? I saw their vehicles go by the house. And at some point, did they come, one of them come to help you get out of the abandoned building? Yes, sir. Who was it that came? Sergeant Cheshire. And how did he do that? Well, first, when they arrived, Sergeant Cheshire started yelling, where are you guys, where are you guys? And we immediately let him know that we were over at the abandoned house. How did they go about getting you out of the house and out of the area? Well, first, Sergeant Cheshire said to me, he said, Bill, he came into the house, he assessed Tom, he assessed me. We told him the information that we had about the possible tree stands and high-powered rifles. I said, we really need the helicopter over the top of us. And he said, I have to go back. <clears throat> I have to get Wayne out of here, meaning Deputy Keston. He said, as soon as I get him out of here, Bill, I'll come back and get you guys. Did they do that? Yes, sir. How did they actually come for you? Do you know? Sergeant Cheshire went over to the third vehicle, which was Deputy McCain's vehicle. He busted out the driver's window and backed the vehicle up to the abandoned, what would have been the garage. Why did he have to break the window out? Because the vehicle was running, and he didn't want to take the time to try to ask for the keys. He just went ahead and moved it. Is that, is that something you all do on some routine? Leave your car running but lock it and have the door key that you can get back into it? Yes, sir. Most of the vehicles are universally keyed, but those three vehicles were brand new vehicles. They were not universally keyed yet. So they couldn't use their door key to get in? Absolutely. Most deputies have keys to all the patrol cars by having one key. Okay. So they back that car up, y'all get in, and what happens when y'all got in the car? Well, Ms. Heckerman gets in the car, Deputy McCain gets in the car, and I get in the car, and we all get in the back seat, which is a caged vehicle. I'm getting ready to close the back door thinking Sergeant Cheshire is going to drive us out of there, at which time Sergeant Cheshire goes running past the patrol car, and I looked over at Deputy McCain and I said, well, I guess this means he wants me to drive us out of here. So I got in the front and drove us out. So you hadn't shut your door yet? Thank God I didn't. Because you can't open the doors from the inside. Absolutely not. Once you're in the back seat, you're there. Okay, so you went around, got in that car, and drove to where? I drove to 42 in Georgia to get medical assistance. When you got there, were there EMTs there that began to work on y'all? Yes, sir. A matter of fact, during the incident, if you listen to the tape, you can hear me clearly telling dispatch to tell EMS to not come down the street, to stay to wait for us to come out due to the fact that I was worried about their safety. Okay. When you got down to the end of the street, was Deputy Kester still there? I don't know. Okay. So you and Deputy McCain then are given treatment by emergency medical services people? That is correct. And they start taking your clothes off of you? Yes, sir. Cutting your clothes off of you, your gun? Yes, sir. Your belts and all those things? In the middle of the street. Yes. And do they eventually end up taking you and Deputy McCain to Waterman Hospital? Yes, sir, they did. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what kind of injuries you sustained? You said you were shot. Yes, sir. In the leg? I received two buckshot rounds in my left leg. One went just above my knee on the inside and went, it was a clean through shot. It hit strictly fatty tissue. It did not injure me. The other went, went in just below my knee behind my calf. It tore through my calf and the round went up an inch and a half below my down from my shin and had to be removed two weeks later. They couldn't remove it immediately due to the trauma. Was that the only places you got hit? That is correct. 
Now, we talked about this person that, you, that had a shotgun. Before this date, February 9th of 2005, had you had the opportunity on several occasions to interact with the person named Jason Wheeler? Yes, sir, I have. Did you know him by sight? Yes, sir, I do. Did you see him with the shotgun that day? I sure did. Was that the person that chased Deputy Kester down the driveway? He sure was. You could tell for certainty that that's who it was? No doubt in my mind. And the person that was leaning up over the patrol car trying to shoot you with the shotgun, is that still Jason Wheeler? Jason Wheeler, yes, sir. The person that stood at the front of Deputy McCain's car and shot through the windshield at you, was that Jason Wheeler? Yes, sir, it was. Did you see anybody else out there other than yourself and Deputy McCain and Deputy Crotty, I mean Deputy Kester and Jason Wheeler? No, sir, I did not. Other than Sarah Heckerman, who's under the car? That is correct. Now, you indicated early in your testimony that at some point when you were on, you said you were on the driver's side of McCain's vehicle, he was on the passenger's side, that you indicated there was some conversation. Yes, sir, there was. Was that between yourself and Jason Wheeler? Yes, sir, it was. What did you say to Jason Wheeler? I said, Jason, what the hell are you doing? Did he respond to that? Yeah, he said, I'm going to fucking kill you, man. That person you know is Jason Wheeler. Is he here today? Yes, sir, he is. Can you point him out to the jury? Yes, sir. He's sitting right there in a brown jacket with a blue shirt. I don't have anything else, Your Honor. Cross-examination? Thank you, Your Honor.
in various settings um, that I think would be appropriate and consistent with the victim impact. The remaining um, three boards would show similar family settings. One of them shows a Mother's Day card, one with a note to family, um, some childhood photos, and again, primarily photographs with his family. And I certainly recognize why the state won't put these in. I recognize that these you know, are, in the, the context of victim impact, important for the jury to see, but we believe 54 photos would you know, necessarily cumulative in the province of New York. Mr. Weiss, just for the record, the Supreme Court of Florida's opinion states as follows. Although for the reasons set forth, we do not reverse based on the number of victims impact photographs presented in this case. We nevertheless caution prosecutors to be very, ever mindful of the limited purpose for which victim impact evidence may be introduced. Prosecutors should make every effort to ensure the right to the victims and families who naturally want their loved ones to remember through the testimony pictures do not interfere with the right to defend it to a fair trial. We also remind prosecutors of the admonition and pain that when the presentation of victim impact evidence is so unduly prejudicial that it renders the trial fundamentally unfair, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment provides a mechanism for relief. We encourage trial judges to assist in ensuring that the proper balance is struck. Yes. And, and Your Honor, can I add briefly some of the other you statements may. I made? Uh, at least on the Westlaw page, the page before that, the court also stated that they're addressing this potentially more problematic in the state's presentation of photographic montages of victims that have been kept in various settings. They go on to find, consistent with what Your Honor just read, but, but I would also like to point out they find that we conclude that neither fundamental error nor due process violations have been demonstrated in this case by the number of photographs. And the problem, and of course, fundamental error arises when there's been no objection. So I think they're suggesting, had a specific judgment made, this might be different. But there's no fundamental error, there's no due process violation. So I, I, I certainly recognize how the court ultimately found this. But I think had specific objections been made, it might have been different. And your objection is to the cumulative nature, and which ones are you asking to be included? Which ones are you asking to be excluded? We would have no objection to states three, you know, which is this board. We would object to four, five, and six. And my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. First of all, what's the state's position? Your Honor, the state's position is that this issue has been decided by the Florida Supreme Court. I was there when I argued this case and briefed this case, and I report to the court for the preceding page in the Florida Supreme Court opinion, where they said, and I quote, there is nothing in our case law or the victim impact statute that prevents the case from presenting photographs as part of its victim impact evidence, and as with victim impact from evidence, victim impact evidence from witnesses, we have never drawn a bright line as to the number of permissible photographs that the state may present. In this case, we conclude that neither fundamental error nor a due process violation has been demonstrated in this case by the number of photographs alone where Wheeler has not identified any particular photograph or group of photographs that was impermissibly prejudicial so as to render the penalty phase fundamentally unfair. That is what the Florida Supreme Court said about those photographs. Now, I will tell the court that we will present them as victim impact evidence in a different format through the use of a PowerPoint presentation while some of the victim impact witnesses are testifying. But these boards are already in evidence and will be what goes up with the record on appeal if it goes. And I do not intend to be using these boards if that makes a difference to the defense's argument. So, Mr. Nunley, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying there's not going to be four individual boards shown, but they're going to be shown on PowerPoint with 54 pictures. Yes, sir. And they're three separate 
they're split up into three segments of three or four slides per segment, I believe it is. <laughs> there are multiple pictures on some slides. It's not a, it's not, one picture is not on each slide, for example. The state's position is that the Florida Supreme Court has already ruled on this issue. There's no reason to readdress it. There's no basis for readdressing it. And that the state would be within its rights within the scope of the prior decision to reuse these very these boards. Mr. Nunley, this is a de novo proceeding, correct? It is a de novo proceeding, but the defense has brought nothing forward subsequent to this decision from the Florida Supreme Court in this very case to say that these photographs are not properly admitted. If they can point us to an intervening decision that says there is something wrong with this, that's one thing, but whether, it, but yes, this is a de novo proceeding, but yes, the Wheeler decision is also controlling, is also good law if we were trying another case. I would be making the same argument that Wheeler discusses this and decide, decided that this was not error. Well, certainly, I agree with that, but in this decision, the Florida Supreme Court says, well, Wheeler has not identified any particular photograph or group of photographs that was infamously prejudicial, so as to render the penalty phase fundamentally unfair. I was about to get to is, I think I need to look at the pictures, and which ones, which ones do you think are so fundamentally unfair, and for what reason? Well, and Your Honor, and I can point that out. So, what's in it stays four, and again, the biggest issue, I think, is the number. When we talk particularity, number four, more than half of the photos appear to depict Deputy Kessler as a child. If you folks can bring that up closer to me, I can't see that one. I don't, I don't know that these, when we're talking about him as a child, which is, for the record, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about 15 of his photographs in stays four with Deputy Kessler as a child. I don't know that that's showing the adult loss of community. Obviously, he, you know, photographs such as these on the other side show that the adult are covered in stays three, I think, are appropriate at times, you know, depending on the number of photographs. But the pictures of him as a child go beyond what looking at that should be, and again, for the record, there are approximately 15 photographs in that picture. So, once again, are you requesting to be excluded? Well, Your Honor, I'm requesting here that all the photographs on four be excluded. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 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 fourteen that show him as a child, I believe, go beyond the written impact of the statute. The remainder of the photographs on four, one, two, three, four, five, six, six would be unnecessarily cumulative to what's on stays three. They show him as an adult in various roles in his family, but these are all, I would suggest, roles that are covered by stays three. So, if you could show me stays four, three. Yes, Your Honor. I hope I'm using the right one. And that was three, Your Honor. And again, three, we have no objection to the photographs of three. I think they depict Deputy Kester with his family. They depict his military background, his football coach. I think these cover, I believe there are 18, if I count correctly, photographs that would be consistent with the written impact of the statute. You're asking board four be excluded? Board four be excluded. Board three, we have no objection. Or board one or board two? Well, Your Honor, could I grab board five? Please do. That's what I'm asking. Which ones are you asking to be excluded? How many boards are there in board total? There's four. And really, Your Honor, board six, for the record, it has six additional photographs. They show family. I don't think we really have an issue with board six. So, three and six, we have no problem. Again, six shows family, but it shows really family of his at a younger age. We have no issue with three and six. Board five, again, shows family, but it shows family of his at a younger age. 
Again, Your Honor, we would suggest that all the photographs in Board 5 are necessarily cumulative to what's on 3 and 6, show them with family. Um, in addition, Your Honor, aside from photographs, it also has a Mother's Day card. It has a note that was written um, to a family member. It has a picture that is, uh, or a school card that looks like that's one of the children uh, prepared. I would suggest when we talk about the letter, the note, the school project, those three items on the outside show the significant impact rule. The remainder of the photographs on stage five, I would suggest they're not necessarily cumulative to what's on stage three. Mr. Miller, you're going to talk about how many of the There are different photographs and different circumstances showing different things and different aspects. They do a one country one. There's nothing wrong with the state and the government process issue with the state making the jury aware of who claimed that they want. They're going to hear all the next week about what Mr. Keeler blew up on. I can't put that out on the phone. But if you go into A and B Tennessee, they talk about murder being the ultimate act of depersonalization and that the due process clause of the Fourth Amendment does not present, prevent the state from trying to give some of that back through the presentation of that testimony. And the state's position is that these boards and these photographs are not in the presentation, they are not being used, they show different phases of one capture plot. And the jury is entitled to hear this under the Grove Supreme Court precedent, the Grove Court Supreme Court precedent, and the Court of Special. Yes, he's worth the court. That's what I can say. So, Mr. White, is it your position that no photographs of him at the South should be shown to the jury? Your Honor, I think that potentially one or two photographs of him as a child may be appropriate. The problem, again, is we have 15. There's only photographs of him as a child. Thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Miller, you have a question? Yes, Your Honor. I think that the state has to show that the photographs are not the photographs of Mr. Chester at certain stages of his life, when he's younger, but not all the same. Does that make sense at different stages? Yes. Three of them. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. And I find the rest of them are not prejudicial and fair to Mr. Wheeler. They are not cumulative. They show Deputy Chester at different stages of his life, and I think that they're not prejudicial and fundamentally necessary. All right. Next witness. Who's going to be the state's next witness again? Stephen Cogswell. Stephen Cogswell? Yes, sir. C-O-G-S-W-E-L-L. Any reason we can't bring the jury in now? No, Your Honor. The jury in now.
I'm Dr. Stephen Cogswell. The last name is spelled C O G S W E L L. How are you employed, sir? Currently, I'm the Deputy Chief Medical Examiner in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, in 2005, I was the Chief Medical Examiner here in District 5. When you say you're a Chief Medical Examiner, or the medic a medical examiner, does that mean that you are a licensed physician? Yes, sir. Tell us your, your educational background, if you would, Dr. Cogswell. I did my undergraduate work at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. Following that, I did medical school in, at the Medical University of South Carolina and residency in anatomic and clinical pathology at the Medical University Hospitals in Charleston. After I finished that five-year residency program, I did a one-year fellowship program in forensic pathology in Miami, Florida. I finished that in 1991. After your fellowship in Miami in 1991, what did you do next, sir? I spent the next, uh, I guess it was eight years on active duty in the Air Force. Uh, following that, I uh, basically had worked as either a coroner or a medical examiner throughout the southeast, uh, farthest west was Lubbock, but uh, beyond that it's all been in the southeast area of the U.S. And when you were on active duty in the Air Force, what was your, what was your assignment, sir? I was assigned to the Armed Forces Medical Examiner's Office, which was based out of Washington, D.C. at uh, Walter Reed Hospital. Um, the Armed Forces ME Office was charged with investigating the deaths of service members worldwide. Most of these were uh, primarily aircraft accidents, but also any um, suspicious or uh, traumatic death on exclusive federal jurisdiction. Um, that doesn't mean every military base, because oddly enough, most of them are not exclusive federal jurisdiction. Most actually belong to the, um, the surrounding uh, state or uh, city. But those that were, uh, were also assigned to us. So I did mostly aircraft crash investigation, but also some homicide investigation while I was in the force. How many types of pathology are there, sir, the broad category? Oh, it is That's a very, the broad ones. It is a very broad category. Uh, primarily, we have anatomic and clinical pathology. Anatomic pathology is mostly what you think of when um, some surgeon takes off or takes out a piece of your body and sends it to the lab, and you want to know whether you've got cancer or not, or whatever this is. That's the anatomical pathology side of the, the broad division. Clinical pathology deals with body fluids. So when your blood is drawn or they get a urine specimen, that goes to the clinical pathology side of the house. Now, under these two broad categories, there are numerous other subspecialties of pathology, like, for example, cardiac pathology or cytopathology dealing with cells. Uh, forensic pathology also is a subspecialty. Forensic pathologists deal with trauma uh, in the context of pathology. So we, uh, much as a trauma surgeon would be interested in uh, dealing with trauma and trying to repair trauma, forensic pathologists are interested in trauma, trying to not only see what trauma exists, but perhaps get an idea of how that trauma came to pass. And what we're primarily looking at is um, the cause and manner of death, but also the circumstances surrounding death. Because obviously, if it's something like a car wreck or a gunshot wound, you don't have to have all that medical school and residency and fellowship and all that to tell this person died of a gunshot wound. What we're looking for really is how, if we can, how did that gunshot wound come about? And that's what we're really trying to do is 
what one of my old mentors used to say, the pathology of circumstance. Are you board certified in any particular fields of pathology, doctor? Yes, sir, I'm boarded in anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. Do you have a judgment as to how many post-mortem examinations you have conducted over the course of your career, doctor? Uh, I lost track decades ago. Uh, it, at this point, it's somewhere between five and 10,000 autopsies, probably a little bit closer to seven or eight thousand. Um, and then there's also external examinations of which there's probably 20,000 or so that did not involve an autopsy. How many times have you testified in court as a forensic pathologist, doctor? At this point, it's probably about a hundred, maybe more. Have you ever not been accepted as an expert in the field of, of forensic pathology? No, sir, I have not. You read offer him at this time, Your Honor? Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Coswell, you were working, I believe you said, as a medical examiner in the 5th District on February 9th, 2005. That's correct. Did you have the occasion to become involved in the shooting death of Lake County Sheriff's Deputy Wayne Kester? Yes, sir. How did you first become involved in that case, sir? Our office was notified uh, that there had been a shooting in one of the deputies had uh, been pronounced dead at Waterman Hospital. Uh, I went from our office, which is um, downtown Leesburg, basically, over to Waterman uh, to examine Deputy Kester's body there. And what did you do at that time beyond the examination? Uh, at that time, it's basically just seeing what we've got. Um, some very initial uh, exam was done. Uh, following that, his body was transported to the medical examiner's office in Leesburg, where a more detailed examination externally was done uh, for the purpose of documenting his injuries prior to releasing him to the tissue bank uh, for donation of uh, or corneas and uh, tissues. Following that, uh, the tissue bank returned his body to the enemy office and we were able to conduct the autopsy proper on the, the following day of the 10th. Did you secure uh, Deputy Kester's personal effects at Waterman Hospital? Yes, sir. Uh, doctor, in the course of your work in this case, did you prepare a diagram of the wounds received by Deputy Kester? Yes, sir, I did. That diagram, Doctor, help you to explain to the jury uh, what the wounds were, what the patterns were, and what, how they affected Deputy Kester? Yes, sir. If I may approach, Your Honor? Yes, sir, you may. Sir, I'm sure when you put us in evidence, it states as if it's 18. I'm ask you if you recognize this diagram. Yes, sir, I do. Uh, this is a copy of the wound diagram that I prepared in conjunction with this case. Uh, it shows each of the shotgun wounds that uh, Deputy Kester uh, sustained. And would it help you to explain to the jury uh, what these wounds were and how they were sustained? Yes, sir. And this is State 18 in evidence. And it would be possible, Your Honor, if Dr. Knoxville uh, can step down. Yes, you may, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Doctor, in looking at this, can everyone see? Uh, 
I'll say out of the way. In looking at this diagram, I see that you have labeled uh, SGWA. What does that mean? SGW is the abbreviation for shotgun or GSW is the gunshot wound. But in this case, all of these are shotgun wounds, so they're labeled with an SGW. We label each wound separately. Some people use numbers, I use letters. Uh, that doesn't correlate necessarily to the order in which they're inflicted, but it's just a way to be able to keep track of which wound we're dealing with. So we have shotgun wound A, shotgun wound B, uh, shotgun wound C, which is on the back of the right arm, shotgun wound D, and shotgun wound E, which is two pellets of buckshot. Um, again, this does not reflect the order in which they were necessarily inflicted. But, go ahead. Let me stop you right there, Doctor. <coughs> Did you start with A at the, at the head and just move down the body in assigning the number, the letters? Yes, sir. That's the typical way in which we'll do it. Uh, sometimes we discover wounds on the back, and so it gets a little bit out of order for the head down. Um, but generally speaking, we start at the top and move our way down and then uh, do extremity wounds at some point. Uh, but everything gets labeled arbitrarily. Okay, so this labeling does not reflect the order in which these injuries were sustained. Correct. Now let's start with, shot, with shotgun wound A. Where is that injury and what was it effect? How would you describe it, sir? What was it effect? Was its effect on Deputy Kester? Shotgun wound A is this wound here that's above the left eye on the forehead. <coughs> this is a relatively close range shotgun wound uh, with bird shot. Uh, the shot pattern has only spread to about three and a half inches diameter, so roughly this size. Uh, the pellets are mostly in a coherent mass, but there are some that are, are starting to spread from the the main pattern. Uh, this wound not only goes through the skin, but also through the skull. Uh, some of the pellets stop there in the skin or against the skull, but the majority of the pellets actually get into the, the brain cavity itself and go through the left side of the brain straight back and impact on the inside of the back of the skull. And obviously there's a lot of pellets that are still in the inside the skull and inside the brain. So quite a few of them were recovered uh, from Deputy Kester's brain and inside his skull. And Doctor, I'm showing you what's in evidence of State's Exhibit 19. Um, can we take a look at that and can you tell us what that is? I'm looking at it or you need to refer to those. No, sir, these are the, um, the envelopes containing the pellets that were recovered in association with this case. Um, some of these are recovered uh, from shotgun wound A, for example. Some are recovered from the skin outside the skull. Some are recovered from the inside the skull. Uh, some of the pellets are actually recovered from uh, the body bag. Uh, other pellets are recovered from the clothing. Um, and a representative selection of the pellets uh, recovered from each of the other shotgun wounds. Uh, the only one that uh, both pellets were recovered was shotgun wound E with two buckshot pellets, obviously, with only two pellets. That's far easier to recover than 200 pellets, as you can see, the bird shot. Yeah, Doctor, did you make any effort to recover all of the bird shot pellets from Deputy Kester's skull? No, sir, it's not necessary to recover all of the pellets. What we want is a representative number of these pellets. Uh, ideally the ones that are very little deformed or undeformed because the pellets are of uniform size, generally speaking. There's a little bit of variation. So once you have a dozen or two dozen of these pellets, you can either weigh them or measure them and say, okay, these are shot size number eight or seven and a half or nines or whatever the shot size is. Uh, it doesn't really matter what size it is for the purposes of the autopsy. Uh, but it does matter in the investigation sometimes, so that's why we do that. Was shotgun wound a a survivable injury, doctor? No, sir. 
is there any angle up or down associated with this wound or is it a straight through front to back? This is a straight back wound. There's no up and down or side to side uh, deflection of it. It's just basically coming in right above the, the left eye and going straight back to impact at the back of the skull on the inside. So would that be consistent with the weapon that fired that shot being on the same level as Deputy Kester's head when the shot was fired? Yes, sir. Obviously, since your head can move around a lot, um, if I look up, then the, the shotgun is up here. If I look down, it's down there. So, same with side to side. But he's looking directly at that shotgun when it's fired because there's no side to side or up or down uh, deflection or, or pathway to that one. Okay. Moving on to shotgun wound B. Describe that injury for us, if you would, sir. Excuse me. Let me over here. Shotgun wound B is a fairly wide spread pattern. Uh, it comprises, as you can see, 36 pellets that strike the left side of the head, neck, and arm. These pellets. Bottom okay, button. Um, these pellets are all traveling directly from left to right. Again, without any significant up or down uh, pathway and, or front to back pathway. This is going straight from left to right. <coughs> Being birdshot pellets, these do not penetrate very deeply. They're very small. So they do get through skin and they get through the subcutaneous soft tissue and they get into the muscle, but that's about as far as they go. So they're not breaking bone, they're not uh, hitting any major arteries or veins, they're not hitting any organs. So these are gonna be painful, obviously, and they're gonna bleed, but they're not necessarily gonna be incapacitated. Let's move on to shotgun wound C, doctor. If we look at shotgun wound C, that is on the inside and the back of the right arm. And although in this frame it looks as though C may actually be part of pattern B, it's not because these pellets are actually traveling straight forward. So this is part of a pattern again, and these are coming from back to front Again, birdshot pellets not penetrating into hitting any major arteries, breaking bones, or hitting any organs, and stopping under the skin. So we have A going straight backward, no up or down or side to side. B going straight from left to right, no up or down or front to back. And C going straight forward with no sideways or up or down pathway. So the shotgun was behind Deputy Kester when, when wound C was inflicted? Yes, sir. Okay. Moving on to wound D. Wound D is a separate pattern that basically covers the lower half of the body below the level of the belt line. There's uh, 40 pellets, as you can see here, that struck his body. Uh, majority of them were on the left leg. These, again, being birdshot pellets, they're not penetrating into break bone or lacerate big blood vessels or organs or anything. So these are basically just getting through skin and muscle and causing pain and bleeding. Uh, these, the pathway for these is straightforward. So again, no side to side or up or down, straight on going from back to front. About how many uh, pellet strikes are included in wound D, doctor? In wound D itself, we have 40 pellets. And what would have been the perception of those pellets striking Deputy Kester? Well, birdshot pellets, when they hit, as anyone who's ever actually gotten hit by birdshot pellets, they're like a wasp stick. Uh, so they hurt, and they continue to hurt. Uh, they're not going to cause you to collapse uh, unless the pain actually makes you stop. Um, but we have 40 of them here in the legs, another 36 on the, the side of the head and the arms, another 16 on the back of the right arm. So we've got 
uh, 90 odd pellets of birdshot striking his body. Okay, and moving on to shotgun wound E, what can you tell us about that injury, sir? E is a little different. E is not uh, a load of birdshot, it's a load of buckshot. And we're actually only picking up the very edge of the pattern. These buckshot pellets, depending on the size of the buckshot, uh, you can have anywhere from 8 to 24 pellets of buckshot, as opposed to the few hundred that you'll have with birdshot. But in this case, we've only got two pellets of buckshot striking deadly pests. One of them is striking the outside back of the left arm in what's called the triceps muscle. It goes through the muscle, doesn't break bone, exits the inside of the arm at the armpit, inside the, the actual armpit, and then re-enters the chest. So it takes this pathway downward and from left to right through the lung, goes through the diaphragm that separates your chest from your abdomen, and stops behind the stomach, the, the organ of the stomach. So, that is as far as it goes. It's not a real deeply penetrating pellet. It's only going in probably about eight inches or so. But it's going through both the upper and the lower lobes of the right lung. And that seems odd, but, or calling, excuse me, the left lung, I said right lung. Calling it the upper and lower lobes, it should really be more called the front and the back lobes because they sit diagonally on each other. So it's possible to hit the upper and lower lobes with a horizontal shot. And that's what this is doing, going across here. So you get a little bit of downward angle, but it's mostly, again, horizontal. Now the other pellet that's involved, and again, we're only got, we've only got two pellets here as part of this pattern, is striking on the outside of the elbow. And it's actually traveling down the bone that connects to the thumb, the radius, and stops. There. It goes through muscle and soft tissue. It doesn't hit any major arteries or blood vessels. It doesn't break the bone. So we've got one going down and one going sideways. But if you bend the forearm this way, now both of them are traveling parallel to each other. So his left arm, at the time that, uh, that this shot is fired, is actually bent across his torso like this. Okay, would it help to use the mannequin to demonstrate that, Doctor? Certainly. Yes, you may. He may need a bit of support. I'll just help support him. <laughs> Should, use, use the mannequin, doctor. Oh. Demonstrate the, the arm positioning. Uh, if we can... Left arm or right arm? Left arm? Left arm. Left arm. Okay. Um, can I charge the time? Mm. I'm trying to get into the appropriate position with it, sure you can all see. Um, Everybody good? This is going to be the approximate position um, from the, the side view and from the front. And in this way you can see where if we have one pellet coming in here and then another pellet coming here, they're both going to be traveling parallel with each other. Uh, 
in addition, we have, um, here's our uh, pellet pattern for B. And we're turning all the way around. The pellet pattern for C is going to come in here, striking right up along. And then B is going to be all along the back, the buttocks and the backs of the legs, down to about seven inches above the, the heel. And then, of course, we have A, which is being right above that, uh, right above the, the left eyebrow. We're going to take him out of the way. Doctor, I believe we've covered the. Well, let's let me keep you down here for just a minute longer. Um, was shotgun wound E the buckshot injury? Was that wound immediately incapacitating? It would not necessarily have been. There's no damage to the great blood vessels, the aorta. There's no damage to the heart. Uh, there's no spinal cord injury associated with this. So this would not have caused a deadly tester necessarily to have collapsed. Now some people when they get shot, even if it's just a gunshot wound through the arm, they fall down and they're incapacitated. Others keep working, keep fighting, keep going through it and, and only later do they realize I've been shot. So that's a very wide spectrum of physiologic responses uh, or, excuse me, psychologic responses, not necessarily tied to the physiologic responses. Physiologic responses would be, you cannot. You've got a wound through your central nervous system or your heart. It is impossible for you to function. A psychological uh, incapacitation would be, I'm shot, this hurts, I don't want to do this anymore. And so that, uh, these two pellets, one hitting the arm and one going through the lung, they're going to be painful and eventually that lung wound is going to keep bleeding and it's potentially fatal if it's not treated. But the arm wound is probably not going to require much treatment other than just removing the pellet and probably some suture. So this, this one's not going to be incapacitating. Was well, Deputy Kester alive when shotgun wound E was inflicted? Most likely, yes, sir. Why do you say that, sir? Well, because in his chest cavity is about 250 milliliters of blood, which is about a cup of blood. And so it takes a little while to bleed, because as we know, dead people don't bleed. The heart's not pumping anymore. So the heart has to be pumping for a while to get that amount of blood free in the chest. And that pellet that went through the lung did not hit any of the big, the big blood vessels in the lung. It hit smaller blood vessels, so these are not going to be bleeding very rapidly, but they will bleed. So it's basically like uh, turning on your kitchen faucet to where you've got a stream of water um, a little bit smaller than a pencil. And how long does it take to fill up a cup? So it's, it's somewhere along those lines. So it's going to be a little while. It's not going to be a matter of seconds, but it's not going to be an hour. Okay, well, Doctor, I guess if you would take your seat back at the witness stand. Now, Doctor, yes, you may. Doctor, I'm going to show you what's marked in, in his in evidence as State's Exhibit 20. Oh, uh, we need some gloves, probably. Would you take a look at that? Take a look at that item of evidence and tell us if you recognize it, sir.
Yes, yeah, so this is the uniform shirt that I removed from Deputy Kester at the hospital. Does that shirt have uh, defects caused by shotgun pellets in it, sir? Yes, sir, it does. If you would put that back in the uh, back in the bags, well, hold it up if you would for the jury again, please. Step down If we look at the, the front of the shirt, we can see some pellet defects on the right front of the area of the pocket. Now beneath this would be the ballistic vest that was worn, uh, which would explain why there's no pellet defects in Deputy Kester's chest in this area because it stopped by the vest. In addition, on the back of the shirt, we can see a few more pellet defects, particularly up here in the area of the shoulder. And some of these are, well, actually the majority of them, are quite small. Those would be from the bird shot. Uh, we've got one here that Is associated with the buckshot. We don't have the second buckshot pellet because obviously this is a short sleeve shirt and so that pellet would have hit below the shirt. Doctor, if you would uh, resume the witness stand and I guess replace that item back in the witness in its evidence bag. or substantially the same condition as it was when you removed it from Deputy Kester's body at Waterman Hospital? Yes, sir. Now, yeah, approach your honor. Yes, sir. Doctor, I'm showing you what's in evidence. The space is at 21. If you would take a look at that item and tell us if you recognize it, sir. Yes, sir, this is the T-shirt that was worn by Deputy Kester and was removed at Wharton. Does that, uh, does State's Exhibit 21 have any bullet holes or projectile holes in it? It has one on the, uh, the left sleeve uh, up here that probably visible to the jury from here. Um, just near the, the edge of the, the uh, left sleeve cuff, if you will. Is there blood on that item, sir? Yes, sir, there is. If you would replace that item, sir, and again, is that item in the same or same, substantially similar condition to how you found it when you removed it from Deputy Kester's body? Yes, sir. Yes, 
Yes, sir. This is the um, ballistic vest panel that I removed at Waterman. And is that item in the same or substantially similar condition to how you found it when you removed it from Deputy Kester's body? Yes, sir. And as you're uh, holding it up there, the uh, the light colored side on the right side of it, are those blood stains, sir? Yes, sir. This would be the side next to the body, and this is all blood stain here. And are there uh, projectiles within the vest that's caught by the vest? There is a defect in the back of the vest here. Um, and I believe there is believe there may be a birdshot coat defect, but I do not see it at this point. Uh, but certainly we have at least one. And doctor, if you would go ahead and replace that item in its packaging. May approach again, Your Honor. Yes, you may. Doctor, now I'm showing you what is in evidence at State's Exhibit 22. I ask you if you would remove that item from the packaging and tell us if you recognize it. Yes, sir, these are Deputy Kester's pants and belt that were partially cut away and removed at Waterman Hospital. And do those, do those pants have defects in them from projectiles? Yes, sir, they do along the back side. With the court's permission, could you step down and hold and exhibit that to the jury, sir? If we look at the, the back of the pants, it's probably a little hard to see, but a little bit of um, light, you can see the uh, holes, small bird shot pellet holes, particularly along here around the pocket, and going down the backs of the legs. Doctor, if you would resume the stand and I guess go ahead and repl replace that item in the in its back in its packaging. Are those items in the same or substantially the same condition as they were when you removed them from Deputy Kester's body? Yes, sir, they are. I may approach again, Your Honor. Yes, you may. Now, Doctor, I'm showing you what is marked and in evidence as State's Exhibit 3. Just if you would take a look at that item and tell us what it is, sir. This is a blood spot card that I prepared at the time of autopsy. What is a blood spot card, doctor, and why do you prepare one? Uh, in every autopsy, we'll do what's called the blood spot card, and that's basically just putting drops of blood on a piece of filter paper that's in a cardboard holder. Uh, that is then dried, 
dried blood lasts almost forever unless it gets wet enough and grows mold. So with that blood spot card, we not only have um, a specimen that's going to be good and last, but we can cut the, the individual circles where the, the blood has been spotted. And so multiple different tests or agencies can use that spot card to compare to uh, any evidence found at a scene for, say, DNA matching or uh, in cases where it's not a homicide, we do them in all cases, we can do paternity testing, for example. So every case gets a blood spot card. Thank you, sir. Doctor, in the course of your work in this case, did you have the occasion to take photographs or of Deputy Kester's injuries? Yes, sir, I did. I may approach, Your Honor. Yeah. Doctor, I'm showing you what's walking in out of the space exhibit 24. Do you recognize that item, sir? Yes, sir, I do. This is a photograph of Deputy Kester at Waterman Hospital. Uh, during the initial examination. Mr. Fogshaw? Yes. Yeah, with the course laid on, you see the file point right up to the hard card? Yes, sir. Explain what to the jury what they're seeing here, Doctor. You can step down. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you. that was performed at the hospital um, to try and actually get air down into his lungs. So that's not part of the injuries, that's part of the resuscitated uh, efforts. If we look here, we can see the uh, basically shotgun wound A with the very dense central concentration of pellets and the broader area of what are called satellite pellet wounds. That is, they're starting to spread away from the, the main part of the, the shot pattern or cluster. Uh, in addition, we can see some of these pellet marks down here coming from shotgun wound B. So although we have most of them going straight back this way, we have a few like this one and then with this one and that one are part of another pattern. Did any of those pellets penetrate Deputy Kester's eyelids? Uh, we've got, as you can see, there's at least three pellets that are penetrating in the area around the orbit or the eye, uh, and including the eyelid. The upper lid or the lower lid? Well, both, actually. We've got one down here, um, and then one here. I believe we've got one up here that's on the upper lid. Are those injuries consistent with Deputy Kester's eyes being open when that shot struck him? They certainly can be. Uh, we've got also uh, fragments of what appear to be sunglasses or some sort of glasses uh, recovered from within the wound and actually inside the skull. So um, most likely he's actually wearing glasses or sunglasses of some sort that um, the pellets actually penetrated through. Okay. Doctor, I'm going to ask you next about the order in which these injuries were inflicted. Would it help you to use the wound diagram to do that? I, I think so, yes, sir. Good. Okay, Doctor, if you would, 
have you reached an opinion based upon your work in this case, your knowledge of the facts of this case, um, about the order in which these shotgun wounds were sustained by Deputy Kester? Yes, sir, I have. And what is that, sir? We can't tell the order for all of these wounds, but we know that A, the, the wound uh, here that's the fatal wound, is going to be delivered last because he's not going to be up and moving after this shot is fired. So we've, we've got that one as our last wound, and that is at a significantly closer range than these other wounds because you know, they have much wider pellet spread. So we know A is going to be our last wound, and we know that he's facing away at the time that C and D are fired. He's facing, uh, or the uh, shooter is to his left when D is fired. And similarly with E, with the, the buckshot load. Now again, E is coming from the very edge of the pattern, and these may well be flyers that aren't really even associated with that pattern very closely. So we can't tell a whole lot with those. But uh, most likely, um, given the witness statements, B is going to be an early shot, if not the first shot. And A is going to be the last shot, with these others coming in somewhere in the middle. And the order of those, I can't really tell. Okay. Have you reached an opinion, Doctor, about the cause of death of Deputy Wayne Kester? Yes, sir. It's multiple shotgun wounds. And have you reached an, an opinion about the manner of his death? Yes, sir. It's homicide. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross examination is issued. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sorry, say again. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, you go there? No, Your Honor, I don't. Could, could we flip the uh, projector on or the uh, screen on? Okay. Yes, sir. I can. Afternoon. Afternoon, sir. Doctor, I think this was pretty clear from your testimony, but you, you determined there are five separate injuries on Deputy um, Kester, correct? Yes, sir. And you determined that based on the angle of the various entry wounds, correct? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> four of the five uh, wounds are sustained from a shot fired from a greater distance than the fatal wound, correct? That's correct, yes, sir. Um, and four of the five shots are clearly bird shot, correct? That is also correct, yes, sir. Um, you're not able to say which shotgun might have fired any of those particular five shots, correct? No, sir, I cannot. Um, the one wound that is sustained from buckshot, uh, two pellets hit W. Kester, correct? That's correct, yes, sir. And I think you mentioned this a couple of times, but you think that those would have been pellets that would have been on the, at the edge of the buckshot pattern? Correct. And you used a word just a few minutes ago, flyers. Yes, sir. What's a flyer? In any, uh, well, any shot pattern, there are going to be some pellets that are deformed and don't fly along with the rest of the pattern. Uh, the deformation usually occurs when the pellets are going down the barrel of the gun and they're being scrubbed against the inside of the barrel. It kind of flattens it. Um, sometimes they can be uh, actually flattened by the shot itself. Uh, smashing that column of buckshot. But in any case, uh, there tends to be, uh, particularly with buckshot, one or sometimes two pellets that don't fly along with the rest of the pattern. They tend to go off and go their own way, as it were, and aren't real uh, tight into the rest of the pattern. A lot of this depends on what kind of wad is used. Uh, the gun itself, what choke, etc., etc. There's a lot of variables going on with this, but generally speaking, even with birdshot, you're going to find some flyers. You'll find flyers with buckshot. So any shot pattern will have some that fly off, as it were, which is why they're called flyers. Um, now, 
With regards to the two buckshot pellets, I believe you testified that Deputy Kessler was most likely alive when those hit, correct? Yes, sir. All right. And you're able to make that determination because, as you stated, there's blood loss at the site of at least one of those buckshot impacts, correct? Yes, sir, the one that entered the chest and hit the lung. And based on the amount of blood you see, is it not your opinion that he was alive for give or take 30 seconds uh, after he was hit with the buckshot? Yes, sir, that's a, a good approximation. Okay. And you gave the example of a, a pen, uh, you know, you want to think about, about a pencil stream, pencil width stream of water filling up a cup. Yes, sir. And that would be about how long it would have been that he was alive? Roughly. That, that's a rather clumsy analogy, but it's, it's one I think that most people can relate to. Sure, for sure. And am I correct that when a heart, or when a person is excited, their heart is going to be beating more rapidly than it would if they were at rest? That's correct. And obviously, if a heart is beating more rapidly, it's also losing blood at a faster rate than it would if it were beating at just a normal resting pulse rate. Correct. When Deputy Kester sustained the fatal shot, he would have immediately collapsed, correct? Yes, sir. And if, he, if his death was not immediate, it would have been within a few seconds, correct? Yes, sir. Now, after, even though he would have been dead, would he have also had some, uh, some residual body function that may be still going on for some period of time afterwards? He may have. Uh, the body doesn't all die at the same time. So there may have been um, some weak cardiac function. Um, his organs would not have shut down immediately uh, upon that shotgun wound. It would have taken them a few minutes to shut down. So we don't die instantly. We lose awareness and consciousness instantly with damage to the brain, but um, the rest of the body sort of has its own internal function. And until those organs run out of oxygen, they can continue to function. And you said some, I believe you said weak cardiac function. Uh, would that be maybe a faint pulse could sure. still be detected? Okay. But functionally, if not immediately, within a few seconds after the shot, Deputy Kester is dead. Yes, sir. That's correct. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Were you at those issues? No, Your Honor. Is where you go? He is, Your Honor, and released from his subpoena. Yes. Yeah. Take your time. You'll have a good day. Thank you, Your Honor. Take that for this. Council approach.
can give the time if the evidence, if the impact evidence is admitted to the request. Are you requesting that? We are, Your Honor, but again, not um, by requesting it. Just to make sure we're not waiving um, our previous objections. Yes, so your previous objections are noted for the record. This is just when you know, we read before or after the evidence, this is impact evidence is submitted before. I would say before. That's fine. Okay. Good. Your instructions that you have heard, I would say you are about to hear evidence. Okay. All right, we'll be back here at 125. We'll be in the next one for time. CD and make the changes on the CD and then print out the various slides to go back with the jury. It does so. That's fine. All right, sounds good to me. I just don't want to be taking pictures off something that's already in evidence. Yes, sir. I understand it. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. All right, thank you.
put the track box in there. Is it hurt you?
Rivera versus State of Florida, 8.576304, and Gonzalez versus State, 1367, 3rd, They are extremely lengthy and have not been written yet. Okay. And also, I have a stipulation at the fingerprint scale on my desk. Yes, sir. That probably needs to be read now. That's, tell me what. Tell me when you want it read. Well, go ahead and read that one. Jerry comes in. You have a jury back there? Yes, sir. Any reason we can't bring him in at this time? No, you're right. Let us bring him in, please. Once again, I'm going to read you the standard jury instructions for stipulation. When lawyers agree that certain facts are true, that is called a stipulation of fact. You must accept stipulated facts as having been proven. However, the significance of these facts, as with all facts, is for you to decide. In this case, the stipulated fact that you must accept as true is no useful fingerprint evidence was found at the crime scene to which 27300 held the avenue case in Florida. State's next witness. The next witness will be Paula Castello, Your Honor. Yeah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read your standard jury instruction regarding victim impact statements. You are about to hear evidence about the impact of this murder on the family, friends, community, and one investor. This evidence was presented, is going to be presented to show the victim's uniqueness as an individual and the result of loss by one investor's death. However, you may not consider this evidence as an aggravating factor. Good afternoon. Tell the jury your name and spell your last name for the court reporter, please, ma'am. Paula Kester Casella, C A S S E L L A. And how are you related to Wayne Kester? Um, legally, it's my brother, but I was, became his mother when he was 13. Have you prepared a written statement that you would like to read to the jury? You have. Go ahead and read that statement, if you would, please, ma'am. Wayne Joseph Kester was by legal standings my baby brother. However, Wayne was much more than that. I raised him since he was 13 when our mother passed. Wayne was my soulmate. He was my firstborn. He was my children's siblings. And we couldn't have been closer than how close my twins are to each other. Wayne's death caused the ability, inability to leave our home. My daughter was unable to go to the grocery, to her attendance, to her doctor's appointments without vomiting. To this day, she has debilitating anxiety, now in a journey with living a normal life, holding on to so much fear. Another child ended up in mental health because she never wanted to go live with Wayne. From a husband who raised Wayne as his own. He was a man who had that for several days. His way of coping war, Wayne's on vacation, he's just a cognac. For our older son, in the days that follow, at the age of six, he asked me, Mommy, if I walk in front of that truck, I bet I can visit Uncle Wayne. From our twins, who were two, when we, when we took away from us, and they were lost looking for him. Where is he? was the hardest question to answer over and over. I told myself, words will never be enough to express when his death was done to me. I didn't know who was bathing or feeding my babies in the first month. Following that, I learned how much I could drink. In time, I was just going to come home from work and hold my head while I bothered him, put myself to bed. I wanted to run and never stop. I could go to the cave and never see that person. Never to love and lose someone who loved ever again. To this day, 17 years later, I can't speak of way I'm not crying. I go to his place. My children no longer tell me when I go to place flowers because they don't want to see me for to help. I had to quickly realize I had six other children to look for and I had to remember they needed a mom just as much as I needed me when our mother passed. I pray for the day that I no longer live in the very day when I was killed. I may not get to see them graduate from high school or college. And then their oldest daughter, the one he was close to, become a nurse practitioner. He was not there to share the marriages, the birth of the children, or see them walk and throw. They won't stand on his influence in their life, and they'll never hear one's laughter, or hear his giggle, or see his smile. They don't get to feel. Thank you, ma'am. I have no further questions.
Virginia Beavert. My name is Virginia Bevert, B E B I O T. We approach right quick, Your Yes, sir. Tell us your name again, please, ma'am. It's Virginia Bevert, B-E-V-I-R-T. And you go by Ginger, don't you? Yes, sir. How are you related to Wayne Kester? I am his ex-wife and mother of his two children. Have you prepared a written statement that you would like to read to this jury? Yes, sir. Go ahead, please, ma'am. Thank you. Well, thinking on the last 17 years and how our lives would have been different if we had Wayne in them, these are my thoughts. Has the pain gone away? No. It becomes a part of who we are. Does the loss get easier? No. We just learn to accept it. Never feeling whole, never good enough, always wondering if their dad would be proud of them, are some of the emotions my children went through. As a parent, my heart broke every time my kids had an important event or time in their lives where they wished their dad could be there to share in that moment, build memories. Wayne has three beautiful grandbabies that will never have one memory with him, never know him. Parenting two kids that lost their father tragically was not easy. Always overcompensating to fill that loss, that void. Not wanting to let them down, yeah, I gave them a lot. It was never enough. Nothing could fill their father's loss, not even me. I had to watch my children being known as Wayne Kester's kids, never just Amber and Ryan. There was always that dark cloud hanging over their heads, preventing them from their full potential. They just couldn't have a normal kid's life with both parents doing what most kids do. They have been reminded of their father's death every day for the last 17 years with no peace and no closure. I fear they will never be able to heal from their father's loss. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. State's, next State's next witness will be Amber Kester. This time, Your Honor, I would offer into evidence by agreement States you, 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 you which is a composite consisting of the photographs that will be published by PowerPoint during the testimony of the next three witnesses. There are no objections to the previous No objection in case, thank you. So we sort of move.
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Tell us your name and spell your last name for the record. My name is Amber Kester, K-O-E-S-T-E-R. And how are you related to Wayne Kester? I'm the daughter of Wayne Kester. Ma'am, have you prepared any written statement that you would like to read to this jury? I have. Go ahead if you would, please, ma'am. I was 13 years old. 13 years old when I was told that my dad went to work and he wasn't coming home. And no child should have to hear. They did everything they could to save him. Yet I heard it on the morning of February 9th, 2005. My dad went to work and that was the last we would see of him. My heart was shattered and confused. Since that day, <laughs> I've had graduations, jobs, nursing school, relationships, and three beautiful children. But I also have had depression, abandonment issues, and self-doubt. I never got to pick up the phone and call him because my car was making a funny noise, or maybe because a boy broke my heart. I never got to see him snuggle his grandbabies and watch his face light up with pure love and joy. These are just simple moments that were stolen from me. From then on, I was never just Amber Kester, I was then known as Deputy Kester's daughter, and that's what I'm known for even now. I never got to be just me. My dad's death being plastered all over the television and newspapers made grieving impossible. It's not just me that his death has affected. It affected family, friends, deputies, and even my 11-year-old son who came off the bus one day in tears. Another child was talking about his grandpa. My son then thought of his Papa Wayne, and it broke his heart that he never knew him and was able to have those memories made as his classmates did. My dad, Deputy Wayne Kester, had a huge heart. Excuse me. He was a husband, father, son, brother, officer, and National Guard. He dedicated his life to being there for anyone who may have needed him. He spent his days coaching boys football, helping me with my cheers, practicing my flute, trying to prank us kids, or enjoying his football games. He meant a lot to the whole community. I've come to think that in his last moments, he died trying to fight and live for all of us. The world didn't deserve losing such a kind soul. As I've grown into an adult, I still continue to battle losing my dad daily, and I always will. I didn't deserve to grow up without a father. Thank you, ma'am. relationship to Wayne Kester? Sir. I'm the son of Wayne Kester. Have you prepared a written statement that you would like to share with this jury this afternoon? Yes, sir. Go ahead and read, and read it if you would, sir. Hi, my name is Ryan Kester. I'm the son of Deputy Wayne Kester. February 9, 2005, my life changed forever. As an 11-year-old boy, to lose his father absolutely killed my learning, my self-esteem, and my development. As a young growing boy, deserving to go through life and get help by his father, I lost those opportunities. I acted out as a child and begged for my dad's attention. Between my stepmother and three sisters, it was hard not to get this hard not getting attention as the only boy. Now I'm much quieter and analyzing. This event shifted my whole life to a different track. Sorry. 
my last memory that I had of my dad was when they dropped me off one day morning for school. He told me, I'll see you on Friday, son, I love you. And then Friday morning is when the crime happened. And it was hours away from seeing my role model. A man I look up to. Instead, my family was bombarded by the news reporters at my aunt's house. At my aunt's house, after all the adults told the children that my father had passed away. I don't really remember the next month or two after that. I was completely numb. I couldn't understand or fathom how or why he was born. And I would never see him again. When my dad passed, a lot of my family cared about money more than family. I don't talk too much of my dad's family. He held everyone together. When he, when he passed, when he passed, all the glue, like, all the glue washed away. My love, my loving, my loving sister were never the same. She was shut down and destroyed. Both of us were. We both did counseling and tried to get help through our trauma. I'm not sure how she did. To be honest. We didn't talk about that much, even though he's our hero. Still to this day, 17 later, it's still too raw. But that's hard. approach, Ron. Better approach. Yeah. Go ahead if you want to. Sorry. I don't think this is the redacted. I'll give you more, Judge. Still too raw, but I talked and wrote down my feelings. I feel like it didn't really help too much. I try my best to get every through. I try my best to get through every day, but not a day goes by and I don't think about him. And if I'm doing right, or if he would even be proud of the man I've become, but I'll never know. He will ever be at my wedding or see me with my first child. I'll never get to see him play with my grandchildren or have him sit and drink beer with me and just talk about life. I'll never have those experiences with me. He was in the National Guard and I joined the Army. And I, I took that path so that he would hopefully be proud of me. And I hope he is proud of me. And I love him and miss him. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Introduce yourself to the jury and tell them your name and spell your last name, please. Yes, sir. My name is Kristen Thompson, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. And do you know Ashley Kester? I do. Did she ask you to read her victim impact statement? She did, yes, sir. And do you have that in front of you? I do. Are you ready to read this? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead, if you would, please, ma'am. Wayne was so much to so many. Wayne was a husband, daddy of four, little brother, son, son-in-law, uncle, nephew, and friend. He was a Lake County Deputy Sheriff and a soldier in the Army National Guard. 
He was a mentor and teacher to new recruits and a youth football coach. He was all these things and more. There is no way that you can ever prepare for the loss of your loved ones. When it does happen, people say things like, time heals all wounds, or he's in a better place. Time does not heal all wounds, not for some. It creates deeper wounds that can never fully heal and grow. He is in a better place? No. His place was with us. His place was here with his children. His children? I had to look into the eyes of a child and tell them one of their biggest fears came true. I had to watch their faces lose the innocence I had always tried to protect them from. I saw the pain in the eyes of the children who try so hard to be strong. They all miss him so much, their hearts are broken for the rest of their life. He has missed every moment of their lives and all the special occasions and achievement a child can have. His children, who never got the chance to spend their lifetime with him, he was not there to finish teaching Jordan to ride her bike. He was not there to chase away the young men who came to take out Jamie and Amber out on their first dates or to tell them that the dress was short enough. He was not there to watch his Ryan play football, something he always did when he was here. He was not there to watch all of the, grand all of the children graduate from high school and start college. He missed the birth of his grandchildren. He missed Ryan joining the military just like his dad. <clears throat> he was not there to watch Jamie and Jordan follow in his footsteps. He was not there to proudly pin on their badges. I feel like I can never let my guard down. In our new world, every time someone knocks on my door, my heart races. When my phone rings, I'm scared to death to answer it because I don't want the devastating news that could come on the other end of that line. As if that isn't enough, it's the nightmares. Horrible nightmares that come around when I pray to God they would just stay away, even for just one night. I have nightmares <coughs> excuse me, that scare me so bad that I wake up just trying to catch my breath. When it's not the nightmares, the children and I are fighting, it's how to protect them all on my own. I'm afraid to let my children leave the house because something could happen and I wouldn't be there to help them or protect them. My daughters are first responders. I will never forget walking into the hospital and seeing the faces of his fellow brothers. And I will never forget holding his hand but not really understanding why the hand I placed his wedding ring on was so cold or why there was a towel covering his face or hearing the sound of my own screams when they told me he was gone. I have to live like this, accept this horror over and over again, knowing he would not be coming home. I wake up at night hoping that it was nothing but a horrible dream, but reality always sinks in and punches me in the gut. We lost Wayne forever. Ashley Kester, widow of Lake County Deputy Sheriff Wayne J. Kester, 1426. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir.
the record for the jury's left courtroom. Turn on the TV. All right, folks. Any motions to be submitted to the record at one time? I was just looking for a new one previously. I'm going to get his motion. Okay. Thank you, folks. So, Monday morning, 8-15, you'll be ready to do witnesses. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you so much. 8-15. Anything else we need to address at this time? I don't believe so, Your Honor. We have, we've been talking about how the defense would like to have the jury instructed on the lesser included offense. Well, we can do that as well. But I would like to have the jury instructed on the lesser included offense. First of all, would be discovery depositions of the state's expert witnesses. We have got one such deposition scheduled for Monday after court. We will of course work with the defense and work out a schedule to do the other depositions if they wish to do so. There has also been some discussion about what I guess could best be described as perpetuation of testimony of two witnesses for the defense who are not available to travel for one reason or another. We have not completely decided how to do that yet. We are, I think, leaning toward doing it by the video and allowing the video to be played. I understand that these witnesses are unable to travel. And I'm trying to be as accommodating as I can to the defense with this, but there's only so much I can do and there are only so many hours in the day. Who are we addressing this issue for the defense? There's three witnesses. They're anticipated to be brief witnesses, 10 to 15 minutes. I can make myself available pretty much this evening, tomorrow morning, all afternoon and evening Sunday. I can set it up via Zoom. They're not complicated witnesses, but they're witnesses that we would like to call. And then have that Zoom questioning recorded and submitted to court. I don't think it shouldn't be complicated. If we do it this weekend, it would be great. If not, we can do it maybe Monday after court. Weekend would be better. I'm sorry? Weekend would be better. I'm available. Mr. Buxton? I think Sunday afternoon would be fine for that judge. Right, right, right. And we're trying to do this so we don't do the Zoom thing in court, which we had discussed earlier. Yeah, I could be up there by noon probably. I have to drop my mother at the airport in Tampa in the morning, so I could be at noon, 1 o'clock, whatever the state wants, whenever they want to do it. As far as I'm concerned, it could be done remotely. Well, I'm coming up here to meet with witnesses anyway. No, we'll do it remotely. Sure. I'll set it up at whatever time. And how long do you think? Just for my planning purposes, how long are these witnesses expected to last in total? In total, less than an hour. Okay, let's try to shoot for 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon. 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon. Okay. And are we still on track? Are you still on this date? I'm not holding you to it, but are you still on this date? Two days of testimony? So, I anticipate all day Monday. I'm leaving as soon as we're done in court today. I'm going to the jail to meet with my client and discuss whether or not he'll be testifying or not in the duration of his testimony. There may be some overlap into early Tuesday morning, but I have a feeling that unless there's more cross than anticipated, that we can finish everything except for Mr. Wheeler on Monday. So that being the case, would you folks be ready to close the arguments Tuesday? We anticipate having probably three rebuttal witnesses, all of whom are experts. I don't think any of them will be inordinately lengthy, but it is mental state testimony, and it does not go quickly sometimes. I don't know that we would be in a position to close 
on Tuesday and charged the jury that they might be able to close the gun, but I'm not here to be optimistic. Here is my thoughts. I would like to do closing arguments, hopefully the later part of the day, bring the jury back the next morning, give them the instructions up, and they'll deliberate all day long. We might, we might have to run late on TV to do that, but we could do that. I think that's probably the best way. That way we're not rushing to give them all the data to the if they need it. And then I know the judge is talking about suppressing the jurors, so that would give them more time to talk. My, my, my only concern with that, Your Honor, is, um, first of all, I don't know that my posting is going to, I'm generally not very lengthy. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be over an hour, but frankly, I, my, my thought would be I probably won't be more than maybe half an hour. But don't hold me to that, so I'll be safe to say now. Um, if we're going late, later than what we have been, jury is tired. I just right. brought on to have not kept anybody here. No. And I don't intend to do that. Perfect. Okay. If All you right. can do that, I want everybody to be completely attentive, and I want to be as much Okay, as long as we don't go past five, so that, 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 and, that's one. And I know they have lights outside the courtroom. I want them to pay as much attention yep. to this as possible. Sure. So, that being said, if we are able to do closing on Tuesday, we'll probably go better Monday, correct? I think so, Judge. So, if that's the case, so if maybe we could do that and... Closing on Tuesday, then bring them back Wednesday morning and charge them and then let them do it. That's our tentative schedule, and that's just throwing out if and how things are subject to change. All right. Judge, my thoughts on my thought is that first of all, Mr. Weaver testifying is kind of a wild card that I really candidly had not anticipated. Oh, I don't know how how lengthy that would be. One of the defense experts tends to be lengthy sometimes. So I'm and I'm just I'm just saying that I can't necessarily anticipate where we're going to be, but I can tell the court that as soon as the defense rests, we will be ready to go with the one witnesses. Okay. And everything everything else is tended. I'm just trying to get a roadmap so let you know what I'm thinking. If it's possible, if it's not, we'll readdress the situation. I think we'll have a good feel for it by the afternoon. All right, anything further? No, I don't. We'll be in recess from Monday, till Monday, 8 15. Have a nice week, Thank you.